We have apologies from uh, councillors O'Malley and Mayhem, and uh, Councillor O'Malley's sick, and Councillor Mayhem has a, well, an injured daughter who's you know, had to have the cast cut off because it was too tight, and another one done, so she'll be feeling fairly miserable, especially today's her birthday, so, you know, our sympathy goes there, but also, well, Councillor O'Malley has the flu, so it's not much fun either. However, uh, we have Ms Benson here, so we can resume. And uh, the plan is to leave item 20 out altogether for a, a later meeting because Councillor O'Malley is the most informed person we have about it and has the, um, well, the best formed opinions upon it. So I think it's, it's not appropriate for us to move ahead with that without him. So we'll leave that to uh, the next meeting. There's still time because there's no uh, particular urgency with that three waters. And so we're just not going to look, we're going to leave item 20. So we'll leave item 20 out. So we'll start the day with item 21, which is the Mosgill heavy traffic bypass. And Ms. Benson is here to answer all our questions and discuss it at length, along with Mr. Ward. Thank you. Do you have any uh, preliminary comments? No, happy to take it as read. Okay. Do we have any questions? Councillor Walker. Um, just, just clarification that point 29 there, that, that finalised by June 2023 20, is incorrect. I presume that's 2024 or 25? Yes, that's correct. So 2024. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Councillor Gary, did you have a question? Councillor Wiley. Um, Ms. Benson, um, just relating to paragraph 12, um, that Wakakate's advice was their preferred option for rerouting State Highway 87 away from the Mosgill Town Centre was between Outram and Allenton Road, linking the then new State Highway 86 connecting State Highway 1 of Dunedin Airport. Um, how do they come to that, or do we have any details around that, and or how that would be progressed? Um, no, I don't have any further detail than that. Just looking through the history, um, that was the only detail that I had on that. Very good. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Thank you, and thank you for this report. Um, the, in uh, point number 13, you talk about the eastern bypass, the King Cross High Street, Haggard Alexander Drive, and as part of that was plans for a bridge through Centre Street um, and across to, um, I guess, the what's now the North Tyree Industrial Area. So that, that strip that goes up Centre Street, that's um, I guess it's still held as a road reserve um, because there used to be funding in the long-term plan for a bridge across there, but is there, that roading strip is still being held and there's no no more thinking about that as an option? <clears throat> to be fair, we haven't we haven't started thinking about options. I think um, the purpose of this paper is, was really to give the backstory to where it had gotten to thus far, to then seek money to start optioneering. Um, I'd, I'd need to check the designation on that one. Okay, well, I mean, you've, I think you've answered my next question, which was in point 26 I was going to ask you. So you've got no preferred option yet, which is obviously what everybody's thinking is. And, I mean, there are lots of options, more than the one that Councillor Wiley talked about in terms of the at Ellington. Um, and there's a lot of interest in what possible options. So there'll be a lot of investigation. Will there, if you get, do you need to get funding from Wangakate first? Yes, we do. We need to we need to get the it funded for that investigation to start place as part of the regional land transport plan. Are there any further questions? There appears not. Thank you very much. So, uh, this is a report for noting. So. Uh, I'd like to move that Council notes the report on the Mosgill heavy traffic, heavy vehicle bypass. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Houlihan. So, uh, does anyone have any comments to make? Councillor Wiley. Yeah, no, thank you for this report. It does um, raise what are the options. 
are going to be. Um, I think if we go back in history and we look at what the options were, a lot of them have been built out since uh, with residential. And I think the, the key stats that I'd like to see down the line is what is the traffic flows, where are they coming from, for example, how much traffic comes out from middle March down um, through into the Tyree, um, and where the heavy tracks are going to go. But I also think it goes to a wider issue about whether we build an inland port and where it's built. Because, um, you know, this was raised with us around the uh, last week as we went through and discussed speed limits and how the roading and the tyre would look like on that basis as well. So I think the other aspect is when we look at all our intersections and we look where our traffic movements are, that Allenton State Highway 1 is probably one of the more safer areas for heavy trucks to enter and exit the Tyree rather than going down Gordon Road. And I think that's the part we, we've we seen and we've heard from the Mosgrove residents, Gordon Road, it needs to change. Mm. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Thank you, and uh, I thank um, staff for this report. Um, because it's a, obviously a very topical issue um, in Mosgiel and on the Tauri and it's been something that's been talked about for a very long period of time and I guess at least this now gets on the work program hopefully and some funding from Waka Katahi and possibly they may as part of this address um, the issues in the intersection um, coming into Mosgiel as it coming down Saddle Hill and, and, and through Kinmont because I think it's just a wider issue than dealing with heavy traffic because as Mosgiel continues to grow um, the, I guess the frustration with um, users and using those intersections, not only with heavy traffic, um, is increasing. And uh, I think uh, Port Otago seem to be quite determined about building their inland depot, and that's obviously going to have a further ongoing impact um, on all of, all of road movement in Mosgiel. So um, I look forward to um, the next steps and uh, funding, and hopefully in the near future from Waka Katahi. Thank you. Excellent. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, this has been an, a long ongoing issue. Um, I can remember back, oh gosh, what, two, early 2000s, it was talked about then. I did quite a few stories on it from memory. And I know Rickerton Road was talked about a lot. But um, yeah, so it's definitely something um, that people in Mosgill have wanted but it's, it's where it will go, so hopefully a good decision is made. And I would say that no matter what decision is made, I would imagine there'll be some people who aren't happy about it um, because there was division around what options you could have. Uh, however, I agree with some of the other comments previously that um, the, in, uh, the change of if we had a port there for exporting, I think that would certainly change things. And it's, I'm really excited about the opportunities that that could open up if that happens, um, especially with the cluster that's developed around that Duke's Road of businesses that are <clears throat> innovative and quite entrepreneurial, quite a few of them there. I think it's really exciting and it would make business a lot easier for them if there was an in-road in port from there. So, yep, thank you. Any further comments? Very good. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, there's been a lot, there's a lot of um, angst mm -hmm. about uh, the heavy traffic bypass and where on earth it should go. And the obvious uh, street, uh, namely Rickerton Road, um, is so narrow and so fraught with a big ditch on one side and you know houses on the other, it seems unfeasibly expensive. And I agree with Councillor Wiley that um, Allenton to Outram is the widest road and by far the easiest uh, place to locate it, even if it's slightly less convenient than going through Mosgiel, but that would take all of the traffic away. So uh, I think it's been a very useful report for us to see and consider and promote, provoke uh, some discussion in the community in the interim. So uh, thanks, thank you to the staff for that and I think it's very useful. Having said that, I'd like to uh, now put the motion that Council notes this report on the Mosgill Heavy Traffic Bypass. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Moving right along to item number 22, draft.
provisions for inclusion in the OSC's proposed land and water regional plan. This is our submission. So I welcome Mr Ward to the table. And I'll ask councillors for their questions, unless you have something to say in advance, Mr Ward. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Just uh, some opening comments. Um, DCC certainly supports the aspirations of the Regional Council on the, um, with the draft land and water regional plan. Um, the submission uh, describes some of the practical outworkings of this in terms of uh, the elim elimination of wastewater overflows, the practicalities of achieving that, and also um, the uh, issues uh, related to reducing water take uh, at a time when we're experiencing growth in our region. Great. Thank you. Uh, questions? Councillor Binspo. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, <clears throat> aside from our uh, DCC-specific water issues, um, I noticed, and you will have seen, substantial reporting last Friday in the Otago Daily Times about our forestry company's concern about setback from waterways. Um, much and all as um, City Forest is able to advocate its own concerns uh, pretty clearly, I'm wondering if it might not be appropriate to reference in support um, the concerns they express about the implications of some of the setback rules. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor. Um, there hadn't been a consideration, but we'll look to see if that's appropriate to introduce. Thank you. If I might just jump in. If councillors, as you're aware, if you want to make changes to the submission, then Council, that, that would be more than editorial, and so Council will need to move something to um, include or um, alter, as happened yesterday with one of the submissions. Can I ask a direct question? Would you like to add that into the submission? Yes, yes, I would. And I think, uh, much and all as we don't need to argue what they've argued, I think it would be appropriate and desirable for us to reference their concerns and support uh, support the issues they raise, because the implications of what um, Mr Dod Sodson um, outlined are uh, serious for the whole forestry industry as well as our own company. And so I think some reference to their concerns and comment and support should be included in this submission. Okay, so would you like a, uh, a res uh, an adjournment to help draft that? Or do you think you can do it right now? Or have you got something ready? Um, or how should we proceed? Why don't we continue the conversation and I'll try and come up, I'll send something to Ms Adamson for massaging. Excellent. Thank you. I think that would be helpful. Moving along, Councillor Vandervis. Yeah, I had a similar um, concern and believe that we really need to, in this submission, actually quote Mr Dodson, who said that under the uh, ORC's proposed rules, the forest would lose 49% of its productive area uh, nearly $17 million in crop value and cost more than $76 million in emissions trading scheme liabilities. Uh, for that not to be quoted in this um, uh, draft, I think, would be really awkward. Um, I think it should be there and I think it should be there highlighted in uh, very strong terms we've got a situation where our regional council is now presenting itself as one of the major risks to this council's um, viability of, of, of city uh, forests. Yep. Look, I think, <laughs> I, I, I think Councillor Vince Pope has had a lot of practice and a lot of experience in this area, so I think we'll see what uh, submission he comes up with and take it from there, but also the chief has a comment. What I would suggest, Councillor, is I wouldn't necessarily rely on the figures as quoted in the Otago Daily Times. So I, if if the Council was going to be putting some figures in, we might want to check directly with the company and with DCHL. Um, yes, indeed we might, but the fact that these figures are in the public arena 
They've been highlighted on the front page of the ODT. Uh, I don't know of anyone that's disputed them yet. And the figures do come from Mr Dodson. Um, I think that uh, we actually need to say that at least this is what's been made public. And um, the public uh, have a fair expectation that given that these figures have been put in the public uh, arena, that they appear um, in our draft. Right. Uh, even if they are caged in terms of, you know, perhaps yet to be confirmed or or whatever, um, they're out there. They're dramatic. Um, they are extremely worrisome. I think for not just for City Forests but for DCHL, our council companies generally, um, who are going to be struggling to um, make a, a proper dividend as it is without this. Yes. Look. Uh at this stage, we'll move on rather than arguing that point. I think we'll leave it to Councillor Vincent Pope to come to come up with a a, uh, a text, and because we have some other questions on the issue, and uh, moving on to Councillor Wiley, and then I've got Councillor Barker, and then Councillor Hulain. Um, thank you. I'll um, I'll start with a couple, and then you can come back to me. Um, Mr Ward, as I read through this and, and looked at it, I'm going, this has a huge impact on, on our city, especially on our future development strategy uh, and where to next. And I highlight uh, paragraph 58C uh, um, and the last line is, plan does not allow for increased discharges for extension of the existing stormwater network. And when I start reading comments like that, I go, um, is there enough vision from the ORC to help us go through this process? Um, and I can understand what they're trying to trade off and, and the importance of the environment and, and their regulatory role. But there's also the balance of living on the land. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, the, the opportunity here is for us to work with the Regional Council. This is a, um, a draft proposal from them and the opportunity through the submission and our uh, relationship with them is to uh, convey those concerns and those points. Then I look at the fact if we had another South Dunedin flood, uh, we, I would, I would see we'd be breaching everywhere and uh, as such. And what, what would the implications of that be if the ORC's proposed land uh, and water regional plan goes to action? I'm not able to fully describe what those implications are here today, but as I say, the, the opportunity is for us to work with them and to describe the uh, the physical constraints that we have in our system uh, and the performance standards that we're trying to achieve with our uh, infrastructure. Okay, I'll add one more quick question. Um, the Regional Council is also responsible for quite a lot of, um, for example, drainage ditches. And I use the example of the one from the uh, Outram Bridge into um, Outram. Now that caused a flood uh, of some land because they didn't clean it out. Would this ensure that ORC do, do keep up their maintenance and uh, their drainage areas as well? Um, I anticipate that would be a practical outworking of the plan, yes. Uh, Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, does the Mayor or Representative have an opportunity to speak to this um, submission in front of the ORC? I would need to clarify that. Apologies. Uh, yeah, because it's not in the letter. I'm quite concerned because there are a number of um, things that have quite an impact. I, I was looking at parag uh, sorry, page 217, paragraph... Um, 95 we were asking for the date to be a vision date of 2043 instead of 20 um 20 40 20 30 um was a little bit confusing about what the date was um because it would have huge implications for the ltp is that there's a lot of issues in here is that the number one 
issue for us, given that it would have huge financial implications for the DCC? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Ostensibly, yes. That's, uh, the, the time frame, I think, for, for any uh, urban settlement uh, comparable to Dunedin, that would be a challenge. Uh, what did I want some more explanation on? Um, I was looking at page 216, and it was paragraph 89, which is just talking about the um, bespoke minimum flow in the Tyree catchment, which is over-allocated by a magnitude of six times its modelled limit, and it was talking about the issues with um, the prioritisation of the water take, whether and we're advocating that um, the DCC is a is tier two basically rather than tier three. Is that is that the second most important thing? I'm just trying to um, wonder about when the arguments are going forward for this about what are the, the key priorities out of here. And I think it's an amazing paper, and I think I really love that you've put in um, changes in the wording. But I just guess why I want the council to understand what are the most important priorities about this. Um, thanks again, Councillor. So, uh, in hi highlighting those critical concerns around the elimination, the, the achievability of the elimination of uh, wastewater discharges um, to the environment in you know, an, an ageing uh, infrastructure setting, but also the ability for us to continue to serve our urban population with uh, growing water takes as the population grows. You know, we look to reduce the uh, per capita consumption per person, obviously, you know, as a water efficiency uh, program, but there'll still be increases over time as, as the region grows. So that is a, a genuine concern, yes. And my next question is on page 199, uh, paragraph 14, and it says the DCC Three Water Strategic Direction Statement, and it's dated 2010, which seems um, a little outdated. Is there a plan to update our Three Water strategic direction statement? Uh, thanks, Councillor. Yes, ex exactly. And that's part of the uh, integrated system planning piece that was currently underway. Um, Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, my question may be answered now. I'm just... What's he said? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, instead of mentioning a figure, that maybe we say we've got serious concerns about the um, impacts it could have on city forests, but it looks like he's pretty much said that by the look of it, without my glasses on. Thank you. Um, so I have a question before we move to Councillors Benson, Pope and Lafiso. Um Page 205, number 44, supports promotion of reticulation of wastewater in urban areas, but considers that connection to the wastewater system must be at the system owner's discretion. I'm just worried if, is that strong enough, do you think? Because have, if ORC then decides that all of these um, People that are in uh, what is, you know, uh, well, the fuzzy definition of an urban area need to be connected to our reticulated system and then overload the system in that area. It's like, if I think that's quite significant, there's quite a significant risk to our systems. And, you know, we do quite a lot of work with managing people on the periphery of our infrastructure boundaries, both with supply of fresh water and. Uh, management of their wastewater and stormwater for that matter. So I'm just wondering, is, is that sufficiently strong enough for this purposes? For this uh, purpose? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, possibly not in terms of the context of what, how you're describing it. Mm. Uh, however, you know, the, the statement is there for that very reason to, to uh, signify the, um, that particular point in terms of ownership and control over uh, the the uh, future expansion of the networks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. On that issue, um, Mr Mayor, I took that to read that the system owner is us rather than the people with the separate tanks that might be connected. Yes. Um, my other question, though, was about 
uh, about the wider proposals and the plan, much and all as we, you, we should be properly concerned about the effects on the major urban treatment discharges. Um, is this likely, are the implications of the pro draft proposal likely to accelerate the need for our uh, better performance in areas like Warrington, Bluescombe Bay, Waitati and so on? Uh, as a regional plan, most likely, yes. Mm -hmm. Councillor Fiso. Uh, tina koe, Mr. Mayor. Tina koe, Mr. Ward. Um, my question relates to um, DCC three water systems legis legislative and regulatory drivers on page 197. Um, point seven. And I'm just, um, my apologies for my pedanticness um, with respect to the sentence system derived from Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Is it, is it, is Te Tiriti o Waitangi in the draft plan of the ORC or is that, you know, um, because Te Tiriti o Waitangi is not the Treaty of Waitangi, is not the principles? Um, in terms of the, if the resolutions go through, it allows me to make editorial changes, I will check which is being referenced to make sure that we have the correct reference and our submission of council is happy with that. Can, uh, Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I just have a question on page 197, uh, paragraph 5, where it talks about over 50% of the DCC's three water systems are expected to end their useful life and require renewal by 2060, and that we've determined there is a need for 3.6 billion to be invested in three waters infrastructure to maintain this current levels of service. So when we're looking at what the ORC is wanting to bring in, does that, would that affect our levels of service and therefore perhaps the investment that we might have to put in and make it more than 3.6 billion? Um, the, it does have the potential for that, yes. And does my mess sort of work out at, if it's 3.6 billion, is that 120 million a year over the next 30 years? That's a hard best thing, there's lots of zeros involved, but because we are not investing 120 million a year into water at the moment. Um, spread evenly, yes, but the likelihood of all capital programs is there's, there's a, a, a wave. So, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> With the wave, I guess, um, if we're talking about our, our wastewater, are those usually maybe around 500 million? I'm making a guesstimate from when we visited the wastewater. Um, and that's always just going to, I shouldn't ask you to quote on wastewater. But is that when you're talking about the wave, is that we will have to replace some of those? Oh, apologies. Uh, correct, yes. Um, the treatment facilities, by the very nature, multidisciplinary plants are very expensive. Um, you can see from some of the um, articles in the media around New Zealand, the level of investment, uh, $200 million, $500 million, depending on the population served, and the uh, discharge um, and the consent requirements associated with them. Not unusual. And we've got a lot of consents basically due to expire, haven't we? And we'll have to go with the new rules. Okay, thank you. Um, given that... You know, we, we talk in these 50-year lifespans for pipes, and of course, it, it comes around amazingly quickly, and the cost of renewals is ever increasing, so it gets um, hugely more expensive. Yet, the early infrastructure that was put in has seemed to have lasted about 100 years. Why wouldn't we specify 100 years or more for the construction of new infrastructure um, and can, well, could we? <laughs> so thank why you, wouldn't we and could we? Thank, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, we, we are very fortunate in that uh, many of the assets that have been installed uh, have gone beyond the design life. Mm. So we'll have uh, assets that will have a design life. Uh, it's not unusual to see assets to be extended beyond their design life. And uh, more and more we look to uh, rehabilitate, renew, uh, and repair assets to continue their 
um, their lifespan uh, rather than replace them with the new assets. And that also speaks to our uh, zero carbon aspirations. Um, and so it's not unusual uh, to find that extended life, um, but design life is a function of many things, um, the level of use, the materials chosen. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a pragmatic balance of all of those considerations. Uh, if you have a design life that is uh, greater than what is n normally uh, anticipated, uh, there's a cost associated with that in terms of the choice of materials or the level of workmanship or the placement. Hmm. Right on. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, Mr Ward, I, as I read through this, um, I see many issues for the DCC going forward, but one of them is sort of summarised quite nicely in paragraph 15 on page 190, um, where it does talk about um, essentially the pro pro prohibition of direct discharges of wastewater to water by 2045. Um, and I sort of think of that, so for example, that would render uh, the current Tahuna outfall um, null and void. Uh, no, I think that's more, that's for treated wastewater, if I've understood, you correct, understood your question correctly. This is really around um, releases from the conveyance network, the reticulated conveyance network. So not Green Island and not Tahuna? No, I don't believe so. I think they fall under a, a, a different level of categorization for the um, discharge of treated effluent to the environment. This is waste, wastewater that is conveyed in the reticulated system, being contained in that system throughout all, um, th throughout all eventualities, particularly under wet weather conditions. Okay, so, all right. Um, that even scares me more. Um, so I then sort of consider, can we just seek clarification on that? Uh, because as I've gone through this, I've, sorry, I've interpreted it as 2045 as being uh, an issue with Tahuna and Green Island, as I read it. Um, the next part that I look at is the catchment, our water catchment area. What and there's quite a lot of content here, and I've come across it, for example, talks about dwellings, uh, existing dwellings, uh, not being able to rebuild, uh, or unless they're built to uh, new technology, hydraulic standards, um, and things like that. Is our water catchment area secure and um, safe through this process? I'm inclined to say yes, but the um, the reason for seeking a submission is to make sure that that truly is the case, and for DCC's uh, genuine concerns to be heard by the regional council. Yeah, because I don't see much reference to our high country areas, um, where the sort where our water sources really begin. And I'm just wanting to make sure that is captured on that basis as well. Okay. Um, the other question, there's a lot about stormwater um, uh, running off. And again, sorry to go back, but I'm sort of conscious of any of our weather events and how we would actually have to monitor that going forward. Would we essentially every pipe that is uh, discharging or even into the leith would have to be... Um, secured or netted or whatever and um, to ensure contaminants aren't running into the harbour. Would that be correct? The, there are many ways in which you could achieve that uh, particular outcome. It could be as you described, it could be other measures, but in terms of uh, ensuring the uh, quality of the discharge of the environment is um, as expected under the plan, um, the yeah, many methods to to achieve that, some of which could be at source. Sorry, one more quick question. I hope it's quick. Um, are we able to, uh, in the submission, add in something to the effect around um, supporting the outcomes 
but having to the provision uh, in an emergency response time to, uh, or is that through the normal consenting process to have the, that ability to discharge? Uh, that's essentially what we're, we're seeking to uh, have in place as a provision here. So the, as you say, that um, design for failure condition, if um, all of your uh, measures um, are exceeded, there's, there's um, the ability to discharge with consent uh, under emergency conditions. So that's a, one of the practical outworkings that we're seeking to have included in, in our submission, yes. Deputy Mayor Lucas. Thank you. Um, have you um, talked with your colleagues in the other Otago TLAs? Because I mean, I know they'll have different issues, but I'm sure they'll have some similar concerns as us. Um, because I would imagine if everybody submits on some issues that are of the same concern, there may be more influence of getting the plan changed. So have you been talking with them? Um, we talk to them on, on many topics. I would need to clarify with the team if this is one of the topics we do uh, liaise with them on. But in general, we do um, work closely with our neighbours on a range of topics. I can't say here today whether they've liaised on this particular topic. But thank you for that point. Mm. That is the end of questions that I have. Is, does anyone else have any more? Right. Very good. Now, um, where did we get to in terms of an addition? Got one more to add. Oh, yeah. Lynn will just get down to Right. In ter just in terms of the amendment or the addition to A, Mr Chairman, it seems to me that it could just stop after the closed bracket, that the last bit is redundant. I mean... You, we could we could stop it there. I was being so that the resolution stood by itself. Should it even be separated from? Because otherwise, it, we wouldn't know what the, the resolution related. Oh to. well, then perhaps it, that could go on the first line, right? Yeah. It just it's just clumsy it's the just way. Clumsy, but the, the, yeah. I'm happy to put it either place. The, we yeah. try and make resolutions that are standalone resolutions. Should they be? Separated. Okay. Yeah, including if we put the the proposed land and water plan up there, yep. that tidies it up and makes more sense if you're happy with that. Yep. I'm, I'm happy to move that, all the bits of it, if you want, yep, Mr you. Mayor. Yes. I could just add, we, can't, we don't have clarity around whether speaking to the submission is to the draft as possible. There, there'll certainly be a full opportunity when the when they've considered what it looks like and it goes to formal notification. So that's a why D is framed in that way in case there is an opportunity. At the same time, staff have been working closely with the ORC and we will continue to do so. And that just puts it out there that we are doing that. To me, that kind of covers the various possibilities. Councillor Hulan? You've got in it with addition of commentary. So you're proposing to leave it like that or you'll put stuff in? You'll put comments in, is that what you're saying? We will consider, Councillor Vandervis has made some suggestions, we'll just need to test those. We've got a sense of what the meeting wants and we will include that um, mm. once we've tested it. I would say that it would be really good to have that worded much strongly than that. I mean, it doesn't... Well, it's worded generally, you know, in a, in a, in a fuzzy way so that it can be massaged into the most effective way after discussion with the ORC and with you know the various experts involved. That's if I could, fine. if you want more definite wording, and I see Council Councillor Vandervis has sent something around that mirrors what Mr Dodson said, um, we would need to check that. Um, so if Council wants to move that specific wording, that, that is over to you, this allows us some flexibility about how much we want to say, but we I, staff are very clear about the point Council wants to reinforce. I, I think we should. Uh. Yeah, I think I think it's the way forward. I'm not. I think I don't think there's a need to have all of these facts and figures included because that's part of the press statement that's in the public arena, and because we're saying here that we are referring to that, then the the level of detail that we put in 
will be determined by the negotiations with the ORC to make sure that our submission is effective and listened to, I think, at, at this stage. So, have we got any other comments at this point? Okay, so, uh, Councillor Benson Pope. Well, I deliberately, Mr Chairman, there's certainly issues around the draft plan and mm. all sorts of areas, uh, but it is still a draft plan. Um, and it's good to have the opportunity to um, talk to the draft as well as the public process subsequently. Um, but if even a quarter of what the City Forest Chief Executive said in the paper last Friday is true, we should be concerned. And I raise this because <coughs> it is our best performing company after all, um, and the effects of some of the issues around setback uh, are pretty unequivocal. I made this generic so that the Chief Executive's desire to check things and follow up and have a discussion about it with um, City Forest staff and or whoever gets to do the wordsmithing is accommodated. I don't think it's this is the time or place to actually start putting the detail in, um, but one of the examples Mr Dodson used was in fact uh, the, the fact that pine trees are a much better environmental friend close to waterways than pasture pouring nitrates into the water or stock effluent running into the water. Uh, so I, I think anyone who read the ODT article I'm referring to will understand why we should be concerned about this and its effects on the wider forestry estate. I think the wording currently gives the staff enough flexibility to convey our concerns, to uh, they can be as specific as they want and report to us what finally went in if they want, um, and um, to discuss with City Forests which are the key points that would be useful to reinforce. So Councillor Walker is seconded. Do you have something you want to say? No, no, no I was yes. asking Councillor Walker. Uh, but no, Councillor uh, Hurland, where you go? Me. Right, sorry, well, did you have something? No. Um, I'm just looking at it and thinking, I, I understand that we're going to put comments in that, the bracketed bit, but I just think somewhere uh, a suggestion I would have is that we need to say council has serious concerns and then blah, 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 blah. You know, just to highlight the fact that we are very concerned because right now the way it reads, it, it, it does, I just think it could be stronger. Oh, look, <laughs> I think we've got we've, we, how many uh, how many uh, clauses do we have? We've got a hundred clauses in our submission. Uh, it's pretty substantial, so one would hope that it will be taken very seriously. I think would, uh, the chief will offer a comment on that. But we will circulate the final version with the changes, so you will see what we've included. Having heard the debate, we understand the the level of um, concern that councillors have. Yeah, and I think, I think, well, I'd like to think that the IRC will uh, get that message and take heed of it. And I have a, you know, a degree of faith. Anyway, uh, Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. It's good that this is a draft and that we do have the chances to raise the, um, raise the issues. And I really appreciate the way that the staff have um, written this because although it was an incredibly dense document, I really appreciate that they actually put in suggested changes to the... Um, to, to the work, which I, I really appreciate it because I was actually extremely concerned and when I saw about the ageing infrastructure and the implications on the cost, that's why I was asking about the, um, what was it, $3.6 billion to maintain current levels of service and that was the bit that I guess scared me the most is actually with any changes in what happens to water, we are going to be um, hit with a whole lot more costs, and that, that, that's a big concern. That's why I also asked, um, on average, 120 million a year, but we know that some years we might have to spend $500 million if we are, invest, sorry, if we are going to, say, build a, a, new, a new wastewater plant so that we are um, coming up to these new standards because we have got a lot of consents that are going to expire soon. So this has um, got serious implications both for all of the ratepayers who are actually going to be paying for this water to be delivered and also for um, 
the city's ability to grow and that's why I asked about um, the Tairu River specifically where we get a lot of our water um, and about the hierarchy and making sure that we are number two in the hierarchy to get that drinking water um, for all the people that live in the city and I also asked about whether we were going to get the chance to speak to it because I think we need to go through and really look very hard at what the key priorities are, what is the stuff that we really, really need to fight for. There's a lot in there that we need to fight for because it's a very complex document, but water is the number one thing that we need for life. Um, so this is of vital importance to the city. Um, I thank the staff for this, this well put together draft and um, hope that everybody has read it and um, seen the huge implications that we're going to be thinking about for our LTP. Thank you. Councillor Vandervis. This proposed land and water regional plan from the Regional Council, I believe, needs to be exposed for what most people that voted for me that I've spoken about it with consider to be absolute madness. This ORC land and water regional plan proposes to wreck our entire forestry industry and much else. If we look over the last 10 years at the cost benefit of the, having the Otago Regional Council, their activities over more than a decade, quite frankly, are questionable in terms of real benefit and their costs have been enormous. One of the major complaints I get these days are of ever escalating ORC uh, rate demands which go many, many times uh, beyond ours, and ours are bad enough. Um, and yet, what actual benefit do the people of the Needham Sea for having the ORC at all? To me, this latest land and regional plan of the ORC is another strong reason why Dunedin should have a unitary council. There is not just no value in the ORC, it's a negative value when it when it promises to wreck our forestry industry and to make our water discharges unaffordable. There's a whole lot in this plan which I believe needs to be kicked into touch. There is very little value for ratepayers in any of what I see in this land and water regional plan other than a very vague, oh, we want to improve the water quality. Most people that I represent are happy enough with the water quality that we have and they'd be much happier if they weren't paying for the regional council to try and make our forestry <coughs> operations and our three waters operations unworkable. Yep. Councillor Wiley. Councillor Walker, I was going to speak anyway, so don't. <laughs> <laughs> Just the look on your face. <laughs> um, but I will touch on some points just made. The key thing is this is a draft provision. And I think that's the key word we have to factor in. This is the first stage. The ORC are a regulatory authority and they're doing their job. This is part of the process that they have to go through. Um, my colleagues that are also uh, that sat on the speed management plan would know the purpose or the fun of actually sometimes sitting on uh, panels and doing cons consultation on things that aren't popular. We just happen to be a customer of this um, or submitter to this process. And I think that's the key part. And it's a case of articulating the variety of views. Uh, yes, I was another that was taken back by the article um, around City Forest. And they are good caretakers of the water catchment. But what I am really concerned about as I read through this was what would happen if our planning for three waters? How do we proceed? Wastewater reticulation would need to be invested in dramatically, for example. Um, and that's not just uh, our basic sewerage, our basically um, Tahuna and Green Island and everybody else. 
The part being is we have 10 consents that go into the harbour and out to the ocean. And how that is, how all our discharges are catered for. I could see us being a very um, potentially high uh, customer or payment um, or creditor to the ORC uh, should some things take place and we just continually get fined. And, that's, and that would be none of our the ability to do what we have to do and put all the good infrastructure in. It could be just a case of variety of storms and other issues that arise. So there has to be a trade-off on, one, the city and city development, two, the balance of how much infrastructure are we catering for going forward, and three, what are the clear outcomes that the ORC want? In the outcome is quite easy, and that is we want safe drinking water and clean discharges. The city's done a very good job in that over the years in improving both those areas, and we'll continue to do so, hence the $90 million spent in the 2022-23 financial year. And I think with technologies going forward, we can do an even better job. But to me, there's a partnership here that has to be had with the ORC, and I think working through this document, and uh, as Councillor Bark said, it was quite lengthy, is that there has to be a balance that we come to and work with the ORC. Uh, but again, they are doing their job. They are a registered authority. They are basically dictated to do this, uh, just like we are in a lot of the unpopular things that we have to consult on. Thank you. Very good. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, and Councillor Wiley is right. This, um, the ORC is a regulatory authority. The, nation, uh, the Land and Water Regional Plan is a regulatory requirement under the National Policy Statement for Freshwater ma Management, and it's their, their job to, to produce this. I think dense as a document is, is an un understatement. It's not dense in, in, in the sense that it's, um, it's dumb, it's dense because it's it's uh, it's weighty and it's lengthy and it's um, it's detailed and it's important and I give all credit <coughs> to our, our staff for coming up with such a, a, st a stellar submission. Um, um, all, all, all strength and power to you. I mean that it really is quite quite incredible. And um, I guess Councillor Vandervers asked um, or suggested uh, we we don't get anything for this. Our ratepayers are being hard done by. But what we do get, thankfully. Um, is a reduction, hopefully, in wastewater discharges to our environment, which um, should not be uh, underestimated in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where our record to date is, is quite appalling, to be honest. And it also increases, increases water efficiency. And that's good news for our, for our people. It's, it's good news for our Tonga species, and it's good news uh, for, for, for our environment. It's, and, 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 I, and I mentioned, as I did yesterday, um, the species that share the Fenua and the Moana with us who don't have a voice and are, as we speak, being, being diminished and um, led to extinction, actually. And, 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 and with every passing day, find it harder and harder to live. Um, alongside us as we continue to destroy our environment. So hopefully this does have an effect that gives benefit to those species and, of course, to, to, to us humans who have, have the privilege of sharing, sharing the land also. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I seem to have caught yesterday's virus because I wasn't intending to speak, but I feel so moved. Um, I want to acknowledge the report uh, and its complexity and the work in the mahi that went into it. Thank you to the staff. Um, for the comments that uh, were made around water quality and people not being concerned about it, well, they damn well should be. Um, and ask anyone who collects kaimoana, for example, Seriously, um, I find those comments uh, really quite astonishing. As to our relationship with the ORC, um, our job is to hone one another to sharpen each other's activities uh, and applications of our responsibilities. And we do that. We have expressed serious concern uh, around the draft. 
Um, and our job is to comment on that. And if we have uh, a strong and deep relationship with the OIC, which I believe is improving by, by the month, by the year, uh, then we should feel comfortable uh, to do that for each other. We would expect that of the ORC and they would expect that of us. Um, we criticise the ORC for, not do, for doing their job and for not doing their job. We kind of have it both ways. Um, and so uh, I did have concerns uh, around uh, a number of matters that were well covered uh, by other speakers, but one of them particularly was the restrictions on the DCC's ability uh, to use existing water to provide for community drinking water. I mean, that is of particular concern to me, and there are many others as well. So um, I think Councillor Walker, I just uh, support the comments that he made around the whenua um, and, uh, and support the submission uh, and encourage staff to really strengthen uh, those comments uh, as they make the amendments. Thank you. Very good. Um, I just have a, a couple of points to make. I think firstly that this is a draft submission, which will be further honed, to their draft plan, which will be further honed. And then we'll have another bite of that cherry once the draft plan is released. The draft plan is not yet written, so uh, it's not yet finalised. So this is their draft submission, which we will finalise uh, for them to consider in producing their draft plan, and then there will be another go at that before the final plan is released in June 24. So we still have another go. And um, I disagree with Councillor Gary that we can have it both ways. I think we do need to disagree with the ORC if we think so, and we need to agree with the ORC if we think so, but I think we need to do so constructively. So it is beholden on us to agree or disagree as we see fit because we are representing you know, the uh, community of Dunedin, and it is quite important in this because there are grave concerns in this draft plan of an enormous cost that being regulated to us at the stroke of a pen. And so I think, you know, just in that, from that instance, I mean, there is a great protection. It's easy to announce all these protections for the environment. Suddenly they all must happen within a, a very short period of time. Well, that is a colossal amount of money, as has been addressed, uh, to and to be able to deliver all of uh, that sort of guaranteed protection, uh, which is very much at the mercy of weather events, and those weather events are, as we know, getting more drastic and more changeable. So we've got a lot of issues to consider here. So I think. You know, as a, over a hundred clauses, and it's a very good thing for us to be discussing with the OIC to work collaboratively and constructively with them to come up with a appropriate uh, plan for the region. Thank you, Councillor Fisson. Tina Koi, Mr. Mayor, um, I'd just like to uh, <clears throat> echo the comments by colleagues acknowledging the intense mahi and um, uh, of the staff um, and I'm particularly really pleased to see Taiari as the correct name for Taiari um, being used and I really look forward to uh, one day here in our own organisation where we will change um, the Waipori fund which means nothing the waipori means nothing it's actually waipori which is the waters of sadness so i look forward to that and um, as councillor gary says in terms of our relationship again it's relationships 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 with our regulator the orc it just goes from strength to strength so Mr. Mayor says we can criticise or you know whatever, and but that's part of a robust relationship. So looking forward to it. Kia ora. Okay, back to you, Councillor Mizupo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am rather surprised that the people sitting around the table would appear not to realise that we have a major problem with water quality in this country. Um, try to look at the maps of what's swimmable and what's not, and you won't have any doubt. And so 
unlike some, I welcome the activities of the Regional Council in this area. I would welcome much more uh, environmental intervention around air quality, for example, where they are currently uh, where they've currently dropped the ball, and I've said that in this environment previously in public, but no surprises about that. But after the tortuous uh, non-decision making about their responsibilities in respect of the Mahina Raki, whatever that river's called, uh, I, I, I think we should welcome um, the fact that this regional council is starting to grasp the issues um, that confront our region. We have been, as a city, much too casual about how we don't manage stormwater, actually. We've known that one's been on the horizon for a long time. And in terms of our wastewater supplies, this is not just about Green Island and Tahuna, where we have very quite sophisticated, very large, expensive plants. But we are not cutting the mustard with the small treat, non-treatment plants and the discharges that we are disposing of to water, largely untreated, in some of our smaller communities. We have to face up to that stuff. So, um, in general, uh, I think the submission is great. I'm glad that people um, have acknowledged the need to make some comment about the implications for forestry. I'm sure that reason will be seen, given how unequivocal the comments from our city forest manager were about those issues and about the consequences of different regimes uh, if setbacks like that were introduced. And I think um, I, have, I know I have confidence in the staff to come up with language around our concerns and support of City Forest that is strong enough um, to keep everyone happy. Thank you. At that point, I shall put the motion. Division, please. Uh, Ms. Adamson will call that. Councillor Ackland. Aye. Councillor Barker. <coughs> Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. Aye. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wetherill. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried unanimously. Thank you. Now, on to something. Uh, possibly equally contentious. The uh, lowering of voting age, item, uh, voting age, item number 23. Ms McCoyra, do you have some preliminary comments for us? I do not. Do we have some questions for you? We do. Councillor Walker. Yep, thank you, uh, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Ms Wikaira, and thank you for the submission and the work that's gone into it. Uh, two questions initially, um, just, and I know the answer to it, but I'll ask it just to clarify. Um, if the bill is eventually uh, passed into law and gets past the incoming government, um, th the assumption is that this would be first trialled at the um, local elections 2028, is that right? Mm, that's correct. Supplementary question related to that, um, for it to become um, law uh, or initiated in the general election, that would require a referendum. Is that correct? A referendum or 75% support within Parliament, yep. Also happy to move the submission. Okay, thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On, on page 222, uh, paragraph 21, it talks about Taituara's submission to the Justice Committee um, informing the draft DCC submission. Is our submission the same slash similar to what Taituara said in their submission? I believe so, yes. Uh, Councillor Gary? Um, Ms. Wikaira on page 122. One uh, paragraph twenty, in that first para point bullet point, are you aware that um, I 
I think it's called Generation Vote, does a lot of work in schools at this time, and that's not mentioned in here. Um, I'm, a, I'm aware there isn't curriculum per se, but there's certainly work being done in recent times uh, by that group in schools and seems to be accepted as part of the norm now. Um, I am actually aware of that and I do take your point that it's not mentioned in there. Yep. Councillor Walker again. Um, just another question that's come to mind. Um, we have a, a, a good and long-standing relationship with the, the Otapoti Dunedin Youth Council um, and the submission mentions we, they've fed into this. I presume they're, um, and again I know the answer to this, that they, they fully support the notion of this, this going forward. Yes, that's correct. Yep. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, are there any stats on a, a percentage of votes in by 18 to 21 year olds? I'm sure there, there is, but I don't have them. Uh, I can get them for you. That appears to have exhausted questions. Unless anyone has any more. Very good. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. Okay, so uh, the motion has been moved by Councillor Walker. Is there a seconder for that, Councillor Eklund? Would you like to speak to us, sir? I would, thank you. And it was good to see a rush from people to, to second this, which gives me gives me uh, gives me hope. Um, um, you've all read the paper, of course, and, and the submission. And of course, I again thank staff uh, for putting this together. And you'll you'll be aware that this all emanated from. Um, a court ruling, the Supreme Court ruling back in 2022, I think it was, um, um, suggesting that um, excluding our young'uns from, from voting and whatever a young'un is, I think is open to conjecture, but we've decided that 16 and 70 year olds was actually at odds with our own uh, Bill of Rights uh, Act, um, which protect those aged uh, 16 from discrimination. Uh, on the basis of, of age, um, and as and I asked the question just to, to highlight the fact that if this progresses, and I will put it in, in, in large inverted commas there, that uh, it might it might again raising what I raised a number of times yesterday may may find stormier waters under a new new um, coalition government, whatever that looks like, and they've indicated indicated that. But if it does progress, it will um, will 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 be the first. Um, People, if any of us are still around in 2028 for the for the local elections, that will come into play then. And I, and I think just in terms of inclusion, that 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 that's a very 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 um, positive and 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 good good thing. Not only because data internationally shows, as it does with many things in life, that getting people young gets them for life. And we do have a we have a fundamental problem here, and we do in most of uh, many OECD countries actually, of um, of voter ennui, and I think um, I think there's good good reason for that. Um, it's often seen as as non accessible and actually, quite frankly, bloody boring. Um, I I mean I've 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 supported lowering the age for a long time, and I, and personally I, I would probably go lower than lower than 16 actually, but this is what we have, because um, particularly 16 for me is I guess pertinent as a starting point, because we we're, we're talking about a large cohort of our population who in fact are the future, who can consent to sex, can drive a motor car, can own firearms licenses, leave school and home, work full time, and thus, go figure, pay income tax. They are already in significant positions of responsibility, and why shouldn't they have a say in how their tax take is used. I think it's, it doesn't get more complicated like, than that. And I think importantly for me, our rangatahi actually are more often than not uh, more in tune than most of us actually when it comes to the existential threat that is climate change actually. Um, I find it quite incredible that um, we exclude a very informed group of people when at the other end of the scale, and this is no disrespect to them, wherever you want to take that scale, make it 108 or 90 or 80, are, are often not informed about some of the things 
that young'uns are, and that works both ways. I mean, older people are more informed about other issues, and don't we as human beings just like a great collective of thought that feeds into to that greater pool that makes society and democracy a great thing? So they should you know, absolutely have a, have a political say in something, particularly climate change, that will be front and center and a fundamental part of their future lives and the children who come thereafter. So I urge you to support this and um, I, I keep my fingers crossed that this ultimately um, becomes something that is set down in law. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vandivis. Councillor Walker has um, equivocated on what really is a young person or a minor. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia, and it lists all the various acts from the Commissioners Act to the Human Rights Act to the Crimes Act, etc. It says, and I think this is a deficiency in the paper because it should say this in the paper, that, quote, in New Zealand a person is considered a child or minor until the age of 20. On reaching this age of majority, the person is no longer a child in the eyes of the law and has all the rights and obligations of an adult. There are laws to protect young people from harm uh, that they may be subjected to due to their lack of maturity. Some legal age restrictions are lifted below the age of majority, trusting that a child of a certain age is equipped to deal with the potential harm. For example, 16-year-olds may leave school and 18-year-olds may buy alcohol. The argument that um, Councillor Walker puts forward uh, regarding young uns being more informed on climate change um, to me actually highlights the ease with which uh, young people are swayed by whatever the fashion of the media moment may be. And it's also uh, a, a quite well established uh, fact that young people tend to vote socialist or left when they are very young. And as they age and become more experienced and actually have to end up paying a lot of taxes and understanding the implications of what government's actually about, that there is a strong tendency in all Western societies for that early left voting to move right. The idea that Councillor Walker acknowledged that older people have a lot more experience and a lot more knowledge to draw on um, as they get older and are therefore able to um, give a more um, experienced view on a lot of issues. Um, for some reason, Councillor Walker seems to think that climate change is, is different and that um, the older people seem to be blind to uh, the facts of climate change and it's only the young people that... Point of order, please. I never, never, never suggested that. And so it's 25-2 misrepresentation. misrepresentation. Never suggested it. My um, apologies I've if that's not what you suggested. That's... Um, I, I withdraw that. I think that's um, it. Fair enough. So, uh, in, in, in conclusion, we have uh, people under the age of 20 in our society given special legal protections because of their lack of maturity under the law. Uh, these are the facts. These are facts which should have been present in this paper. And I think facts that really make the whole idea of pushing for 16-year-olds uh, and Councillor Walker wanted even younger people to have the vote. Um, basically, as I see that, it's, it's simply a, um, a ruse to try and get a bigger left swing in terms of our society's voting. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, um, children, minors, our minor until the age of 20 under our law. And for that reason, I very much doubt that the bill that arises from the court ruling in 2022 um, claiming that they're discriminated against, I think they're actually discriminated positively for 
in most respects under our law. And I won't be voting for this proposed submission. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I've supported lowering the voting age all along to 16, and I didn't use Wikipedia. I used the um, Supreme Court ruling, which um, ruled last year in November 22, that not allowing 16-year-olds to vote was inconsistent with the Bill of Rights to be free from discrimination on the basis of age. Um, so that is the Bill of Rights, and the Supreme Court have ruled on that. There's a, a number of reasons there's, uh, that are mentioned in the submission, including the debate for better civics education has been going on for decades, and I've been part of um, a group of councillors that have gone along with Generation Vote and gone and talked to a number of the schools about their voting rights and it's interesting when they see a picture of the, the council and the comment on the age and I do encourage them to get involved. It would be lovely if they um, could vote and then could stand for council because I think we, we love to have more diverse voices around the council table so that we can have robust debates like this one. Um, 16 and 17 year olds paid $92 million in income tax in 2022 alone, but they can't vote and they don't have a voice on um, where they think this money should go. The 16 and 17 year olds are just as impacted by decisions made by us as people 18 and over. Um, they will be the, I guess, the people that will be paying for all the infrastructure that we just talked about. And it's not just about climate change, it's about the city that we choose to live in. Um, I, my daughter has turned 20, so I'm very excited to vote. But, the, um, sorry, she could vote at 18. Um, the, they have a lot of other passionate things that they care about and we need to be able to get them involved with, with civics and to care about it. She's watched a lot of these council debates. She's very, very interested um, in a lot of the things that we discuss as well. Uh, lowering the voting age has also improved youth voter turnout in other countries and I think that people are mentioning that if we get them young then we can get them for life because democracy is crucial to our society and we need people to be coming in and voting, especially young people. And it will also allow more voices to be heard. I think we had a just under 50% turnout and we need to be hearing more voices so we can build trust in our own democracy as well. Um, I think that Councillor Walker mentioned that at 16 you can drive, consent to sex, consent to medical procedures, move out of home, leave school, work full time, pay income tax, own a firearms licence and apply to enrol in the New Zealand Defence Force. You can already do a whole lot at 16. Why on earth can't you vote for what decisions are being made around you? And there are also many countries that have lowered their voting age to 16 in recent years. And the list is Austria, Wales, Scotland, Isle of Man, Brazil, Argentina, and apparently many more. And we are a progressive city. I think that we, um, we prove that. And I would love to see everyone support lowering the voting age to 16 and having more people involved in our democracy. Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as much as it disappoints uh, Councillor Mayhem, I am apparently the youngest councillor around the table. Um, she is, by the way, my closest competitor. That, <laughs> that being said, it is still a very long time since I, even I, the young spring chicken of the table, was a teenager. So as I do whenever uh, a topic that is directly related uh, to the younger generations uh, comes up, I consult with my godchildren, not having children uh, myself. They are 12, 14 and 16, so they are a very good insight uh, between them and their friends. So once, I, once this came up, I discussed and have discussed the lowering of the voting age with them. The 12 year old, as long as he has access to a football field, doesn't care. He's besotted with football and uh, in answer to the forthcoming question from Councillor Walker, no, he does not support. Uh, he does support a, a, comp a competing team to yours. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll train him. Uh, the 14-year-old echoed, first of all, she said yes. Very quickly said yes, it should be lowered. And then echoed ostensibly what is in point number seven, which is... Uh, they are people too, and they are the ones who are going to have to live with the decisions made. And then I turned to my 16-year-old godson and said, Isaac, what about you? Very quickly he said no. Now this is a, a young man who would be eligible by this, and he said no, which surprised me, so quizzed him further still, and 
on quizzing, his arguments were in fact self-defeating. Because whilst it was a vote for a negative, his arguments, his discussions were so well thought out, so engaged, so engaging. In fact, they, I would go as far as to say, at least are up with, if not surpass, many of the conversations I have with people two, three times his age on politics. He was concerned, as has been mentioned, that some would, wouldn't take it seriously, not vote at all. Uh, some would vote solely on party affiliations and the assumed philosophy of said party. Um, and others still would vote without understanding the potential impact of their actions. And I would suggest that there are people who have been voting for years who do so with the same understanding uh, or lack thereof. What struck me and him particularly was the civics training, point number 20, I think it is, uh, in our document, or the first point of point 20, where it talks about uh, encouraging, strengthening civics training, which, if we are expecting people to be engaged and to, to get people early, as I, I believe Councillor Walker suggested, we need to make sure that they are informed as possible. I can't argue with the fact that there are others that aren't or won't be as engaged as, as my godson is. But I would argue that there are clearly those of us uh, of a much older age that are nowhere near either as informed or as engaged as a growing number of our teens are. And it would seem that to me that ambivalence and apathy know no age restriction. Do I have concerns? Yes, I do. But I'm not sure that those concerns outweigh the thought and understanding displayed by my 16-year-old godson. And I'm also keeping in mind comments that were made during the conversation that should it become a national law where 16-year-olds have full voting rights and ostensibly the full, for want of a much better expression, the full rights given, afforded to an adult, that with those rights and responsibilities should too become the repercussions of those rights and responsibilities, not all of which are currently there. It is a very detailed and nuanced discussion, much as it may seem like a very simple one on face value, uh, and I was interested, very interested, to hear a 16-year-old's response being no, because he didn't think that the rest of his friends, not all of the rest of his friends, would be up to the task. But again, I would suggest if you look around your friends, not all of them are potentially up to the task either. I know some of mine, I'm amazed that they're allowed to breed, let alone vote. Uh, well, s some of them, uh, there are other comments I would make. Some of them, I love them to bits, but forethought is not necessarily one of their strong suits. However, I'm still not sure what I'm going to vote, to be fair. And I won't know until my mouth opens as I press the button in a couple of minutes. But... My time is up, so I will shut up and wait till my mouth is open. Very good. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, for my colleagues who did not attend the Youth Council meeting that we were all invited to, I came away from that uh, reinforced view, with a reinforced view of the wisdom of our young people. Smart, articulate, engaged, uh, as Councillor Gilbert said, a great deal more than some of our peers. Uh, and it was impressive. One of those young people I had known since a wee dot at primary school, and I said at the time just how incredibly impressed I was. Um, that's the calibre of young people, many young people today at the age of 16. And I think too of Raven and Sophie, who were the leaders of climate change uh, the Climate Change March, that first one on the 15th of March, several years ago. And I met them at a local government conference they were presenting. What impressive young women they were, very wise, and showing incredible leadership skills. Moku, who is the Mayor of Northland, now he got involved with uh, politics later, but the calibre of the young elected members, many of whom have been engaged with politics for a very long time, is extraordinary. I had the privilege of mentoring uh, the youngest elected member in New Zealand, Ryan Jones, 
Uh, Ryan was a father at a young age. Uh, he went into politics. He then later become a, became a policy writer within government and now works for a national organisation. What an impressive young man, so engaged in politics, showing a great deal of wisdom uh, in his thought about big uh, thoughts, big ideas, important issues, and it was a real privilege to be involved in his journey. As a former teacher, uh, I have always been impressed by young people. I've dealt with all aspects of their life, um, the pros and cons, the, the issues and the positives. But my overwhelming sense in my life as a teacher, which was my first career, uh, and then when I had interaction with young people of around the age of 16 on the spirit of a New Zealand, adventure in New Zealand as a crew member, was the extraordinary leadership, wisdom and thought and consideration young people have. So it's been my privilege to be involved in Generation Vote, which has been going into schools, invited into schools, as part of that programme to talk about uh, politics. And again, extraordinary engagement from the young people who were 13 and 14 often in those classes. So um, I don't see it as a ruse, uh, councillor. Uh, I see this as a really important, legitimate thing to consider. Um, and I think about my own daughter at the age of 16. Um, and she was in this gallery, as you know, I mentioned it recently. Uh, the wisdom of young people at 16 uh, is impressive. And it's their future that they would be voting about. And it's the thing that is missing around this table and around many council tables. We don't have that young voice. Um, and the closest we have is the Youth Council. So it's their future, there's a great deal riding on it, and I have an enormous faith in their ability to engage, to consider, and to show wisdom in the way they exercise a vote. So I will definitely be supporting this, and I urge you to consider uh, to do so as well. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, it's interesting to listen to the speeches around the table. And I would say 16 and 17 year olds and I look at my two kids. My son at 16, would I give him the vote? Hell no. Um, given the right to buy alcohol, yes, he would have been all in for that. But the key thing is, not all 16 and 17 year olds are the same, not like all 21 year olds are the same, or all 30 year olds, all 40 year olds. What is being referenced here today by many around this room are the cream of the crop of the 16 and 17 year olds. Please understand that. Because I spend a lot of time around 16 and 17 year olds as well teaching them golf and working with them in that space. And I work in other areas with them. There is a great difference between what 16 to 17 year olds think, how they want to vote or behave or their actions. The part being, it's just like 50 year olds. We're all different, life is a box of chocolates. The, the bottom line that I see first and foremost in this paper, is less than 50% of our population vote anyway. And are we going to push to say, oh, we want to get that number up, and we're going to do that by allowing 16 and 17 year old votes? I don't believe that's the right outcome. And yes, at 16 I left home, at 16 I was paying taxes. You know, I was doing all those things. Would you have given me the vote then? No, I don't think I would have been right to have the vote. And I will basically vote no to this, but I do acknowledge the Supreme Court ruling that's been basically uh, mentioned many times. I do also acknowledge that whatever happens, we do need to improve civics training in schools. There is a very low uh, barrier in that point, and I think that's a, that's a very important aspect is civics training needs to take place. We need to have people who understand the issue of council and government 
dramatically more. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of good, great 16 and 17 year olds that would be, that would love to have the vote and could probably do with the vote. But again, when I look at this is about all 16 and 17 year olds, I'm sorry, I cannot support it. Councillor Fiso. Uh, tēnā koe, Mr Mayor, uh, tēnā koutou to the staff and the mover. Um, this is not the first time we've discussed this uh, and um, I mentioned ageist or ageism, ageist speeches. Um, and to me, ageism, ableism, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, it is about power and we have the power as I've said before there are people who do not vote who do not have time to attend to what we are deciding here nevertheless our decisions impact them it's not about individual children it's about giving a cohort the choice and the power that we already enjoy. Um, when Jenny Shipley, as Prime Minister, just before one of the elections, lowered the uh, drinking age from 20 years to 18, I was very disappointed. I'm not, I wasn't voting at the, that time myself, but I was very disappointed because it was a cynical vote grab and look at the damage that has been done ever since by lowering the age. So we, we, we make all these decisions for children um, and we assume that because of our own growing up that they are not fit. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether they will um, exercise their vote or not, at least they'll have the power and the choice. That's what this is about giving people the choice. People who don't vote now, they have the choice. And there's many reasons why they don't exercise that choice. It's maybe a protest, but still, 16-year-olds um, should be given the choice. We, uh, as I've said before, we are a child-hating society. Look at, the, look at all the sorrow and grief that's been imposed through sexual abuse by adults through the decades of these children. Look at the, look at the um, burden that we put on them with student loans since 1999. So we give them all these burdens, but we don't give them any power. Um, I don't know if any of you caught the interview of, uh, by Jack Tame of Lord Jonathan Simpson, Sumption, who's here, he's been brought here by the New Zealand uh, free Speech Union, and he is a very controversial retired Supreme Court judge in the UK, um, and he's got very uh, controversial opinions on the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, particularly by, um, he sees New Zealand and America as extremes. But one thing he did say, is, and that now we have a whole cohort of um, suffering young people because of their mental health because of the lockdowns, which he thought was t too extreme in New Zealand's case. But my response to him would be, okay, we can't go backwards, but we can at least uh, assist the young people who have been mentally health impacted in all sorts of ways by isolation and of those lockdowns and the interrupted um, education um, for them. We can at least give them a chance and, a, and the power to exercise uh, their voting rights as they heal. It's going to be generations um, of healing, um, but we should share the power. Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, thank you, and thank you, Councillor Lafiso, um, about saying this is allowing um, to have choice. Um, and I spend a lot of time 
when I'm not here around young people and my house has been more of a railway station of young people of late than um, normally is and so of course I've, I've talked about this and um, there's been a lot of 17 and 18 year old um, boys in particular at home lately and they almost unanimously thought that they shouldn't have the um, ability to vote and they talked about various of their peers who they didn't think um, <laughs> were capable and my and my husband in his wisdom um, then asked them could they name the mayor or any mayor and I'm sorry to say none of them could do that and so then he asked them could they name any councillor and I'm sorry to say he could they none of them could do that either um, so it's including me <laughs> um, and it's interesting I think it's it's really about um, civics education because then I asked them do you actually know what a council does, and I was really disappointed in their answers. Um, and I think the only way that this would be successful is it's very much about education, because that is what's lacking. Um, and um, we talk about our own children, and, and my eldest and my second, absolutely, totally capable of voting at 16, but I'm not so sure about my youngest. Um, and um, I just think it's it's a very and I like Councillor Gilbert. It is very it has challenged me and my thinking on this because I know so many sixteen and seventeen year olds who have absolutely no clue. But I also know from last year when it was election time and because I chose to run for council and I interact with so many young people, the interest when they knew somebody and who who could they could talk about um, and that ongoing interest amazes me from those those people who. You know, if you take the time, and it is, as you say, Councillor Walker, is once they voted once, they vote for life. And my younger son was fortunate to turn 18 in time to vote in the Mosgiltori um, by-election and then to vote in the general election. And he went out of his way to do a special vote the first time and then um, vote early. Um, and I just think, well, maybe he's fortunate that he comes from a home where we talk a lot about the importance of, of voting. And, and um, I do think... This will only work with education. This is the key, the key to our young people being able to have the choice, as you so clearly stated, Councillor Luffy. So, and thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Ackland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Gosh, it's amazing how much uh, a discussion this one gets uh, underway. Um, obviously, I uh, be, uh, seconding this. I, I support uh, the voting age being uh, lowered to, to 16. And uh, the reason why is because, and, and given my background and my whole life really, I compare a lot of things to music. And for eight years I ran my own music school, teaching a number of instruments and in particular singing. And the younger kids, so I'm talking five, six, seven, eight year old sort of thing, they came along because their parents made them. <laughs> and most of them didn't really do a heck of a lot with it. But the teenagers came along because they wanted to. They weren't made to come to music lessons, they chose to. And boy, did they get stuck into it. And they could absorb the information that was being passed on to them. They went home and they worked with it and they studied it and they came back and they got better and better and better. And the whole thing about lowering this uh, um, voting age to 16 is such that, as Councillor Lafiso says, you're giving them a choice. You're giving them a choice to, to actually uh, you know, be able to make decisions for themselves and for their future. And that's what this is about. Those who are not interested, they won't bother. They won't vote. And the, the, the other thing we've all got to be mindful of too is when it comes to voting, there's no right or wrong answer. It comes down to your own views. And most people that do vote do some sort of research in terms of you know why they're voting a particular way. So uh, um, I'm just going to quickly finish with something that uh, comes down to comments that have been made around the table and that's about experience. Um, and I've heard this saying many a year, in fact Dad was the one that really brought it to my attention, he said, son do you know what experience is? I said well, can't define it. He said it's something you get just after you need it. <laughs> and so the sooner you get it, the better. Thank you. Very good. Councillor Witherall. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I wasn't going to speak, but Councillor Walker inspired me. Thank you so much. 
The um, I've enjoyed the comments from all councillors. I, I think it's probably the most topical um, part of the last meeting for the last day and a half, really, this, this paper, really. Um, I believe we do need a referendum through central government to decide if 16-year-olds would get the chance to vote on local body politics. Councillor Lafiso mentioned about the lowering of the drinking age and how disappointed she was when it went from 20 to 18. May I suggest that if 16-year-olds get the vote, um, they would contribute strongly to lowering that, that um, age down lower. There was recently a, a mock election in a high school in Dunedin uh, just prior to the last general election. Um, the the legalised cannabis party won in a landslide, and that to me spoke volumes. I do believe they are, this, the youth are very passionate about our planet going forward. I, I don't doubt that for a second, but I still believe that they are not ready to form a balanced opinion on how our city is run, how the the uh, financially how the big business of city should operate, and I think they need more life experience before they um, get that opportunity. I'm also slightly against um, central government making local governments the, um, the trial for allowing young people to vote. I think um, a referendum should be held and we should go forward from there in both central and local body politics. Um, so um, I won't be supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I think I could be wrong in saying this, but I think the incoming government has said they don't agree with it and won't be voting for 16-year-olds to get the vote, so I'm not sure how much difference our vote today will make. But um, what I will say on this, I have two teenagers, as all of you probably know by now, um, and I would say, well, without being rude to my two, but right now their interest is YouTube and TikToks, quite frankly, which I wish they wouldn't have so much time on those. But anyway, um, I, however, coming on to um, local government, what I would say is that I have been in absolute awe and surprised by the knowledge and the inspiration of some of the youth that we have met, particularly the youth council members that have come and sat here at our table, and the things, the vision they have and the passion they have for our city and for the world in general has sometimes actually blown me away because I, I can, if I'm honest, I didn't wasn't thinking of anything like that when I was their age. But, you know, there is a growing number of teenagers now that are, and it's particularly to do with climate change, who are really, really concerned about the climate. And some of them, which is really sad to say, are concerned about their future uh, because of what's happening with climate change. And they, because of that, are also very concerned about how we vote on things and about how central government votes on things. And I think those particular teenagers want to say, they want to say in their future, and they're saying to us, I've heard them, that we've all heard them, outside in the octagon when they protested, you know, think of us when you're voting, because they are the future that we're deciding on now with the things that we talk about, particularly around climate change. And I think those teenagers deserve to have a vote. I don't believe that um, that there's, you know, I think a lot of the other teenagers, there'll be many who don't care and don't give a stuff, to be honest. Um, but the ones who really do, I think, goes back to they should have a choice. So I will be voting in support of this because I think there are enough people I've seen that, uh, so passionate and look at Greta Thunberg whether you like her or not she is one young girl who made such a difference in the world 
and changed so many people's views on things. And what it showed me is that one person can make a difference and one voice can make a difference. And those teenagers that I've come across and met around this table and at events around the campaign were so passionate and their cries for future justice, for the climate, for a better future for youth was really strong. And I I just think they deserve a vote. All right. Um, Just a couple of comments that I'd I'd like to make. And then I think, in my observation, uh, young people at 16 and 17, uh, that is a time when they start to think you know, beyond, beyond their own immediate horizon. Uh, for many of them, they start looking at the world around them, at the likes of civics, they look at the, the bigger picture of things around the, the planet. And you know, they do take an interest in politics. Now, that's not everyone, just, as indeed, just indeed as it's not every 40, 50, 60, 70 year old that takes an interest in politics. But those that do, uh, you know, get quite enthusiastic about it, as has just been pointed out. And so the critical thing is to have this education. And education, there may be some education in schools right now, but it's not as much a point if they don't have the vote to go with it. So if there's education, and at the same time as they're learning about civics, they have, they know they have the choice and the right to vote, that really uh, makes a difference to how... Uh, they react to that education because they have the ability to actually exercise what they have learned and apply it to their world. You know, for instance, the city council right here in Dunedin. So I do support uh, that this this uh, vote, and I do support the lowering of the age. And in my observation, a great many 16 and 17 year olds uh, fully deserve to have that vote and will exercise it, and will take on board what they've learned. And I think the critical thing here is that in an era of falling participation in elections, this is a way to pull people in because, as we know, once they they vote in the beginning, they will continue to vote. And I think it's very important in a democracy that we have uh, to have participation in our elections and in, you know, in the decisions that... um, we make about who will represent us. So, having said that, your right of reply, Councillor Walker. Um, yeah, I can't, can't refuse this one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm chuffed to hear, as the signatory to Can this submission, the, the signatory to this submission that you are that you are in support. Um, yeah, I'll start. Firstly, I mean, I'll speak. Try and try and reply to most of the comments, but I'll start um, with uh, Councillor Houlihan who referenced um, the Swedish young teenage superstar Greta Thunberg by referencing a couple of other um, young people in in New Zealand, actually. And the first one is um, a reflection of how we're growing up as as a country, actually. The the election's just passed, and we've elected a 21-year-old from Te Pati Māori um, to, to government. And I know in the interviews after after she was elected, she cited the fact that she got interested in politics early. So, God, fantastic news. Um, and and whether you whether you agree with the Green Party or, or not, um, the most sensible commentary in the House often emanates from one young person called Chloe Sporbrick, um, who also has been a champion of the Vote 16 campaign and also cited the fact that she got interested in politics at a very young age. So that, that's just two examples. Um, like Councillor Barker, I don't run my world, thankfully, according to Wikipedia. I use it to, to cite references sometimes. Um, I, I, I run my world according to reality. And, and one of those realities is talking with and looking 16-year-olds in the eye who are desperate to have a voice, and 17-year-olds, and 15-year-olds, and 14-year-olds, and whatever, about their future. And it is mainly at the moment, it's around things like zero waste, it's around things like biking infrastructure, it's about the environment, and as I mentioned, the existential threat that, that, that we, we, we've, we face. And I, I wasn't too keen on some of the patronising commentary about young people from Councillor Vandervis. 
um, a, a cohort that he's right are very unlikely to vote for him. He said that in a roundabout way by suggesting they only vote progressively. That's not, the data doesn't actually show that um, from other, other jurisdictions, although some of his arguments sounded similar to perhaps some of the arguments that were constructed prior to 1893 when women were battling so hard to get the vote in this country. Um, I don't think that's turned out too badly, um, actually. Um, Councillor Barker, just again, thank you. Thank you for your sensible commentary. It was all, all, all on point. Thank you. And Councillor Gilbert, it's always, it's always good to get real life examples. And thank you for, 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 for giving some examples from, from your whanau. Um, and um, the 16 year old, um, yeah, it's uh, very, very pertinent actually. And it's sort of, I guess, your 16 year old's account counteracts actually the suggestions, the patronizing suggestions from, from Councillor um, Councillor Vandevers. And I'd suggest, and I think a couple of you touched on this, maybe even Councillor Wiley who might vote against this, is you're informed because you're informed, full stop for me. Yep. It doesn't matter about it doesn't matter what age you are. You are informed because you're informed. Um, Councillor Gary, thank you. Yes, and for alluding to that youth council meeting which um, often had me in tears actually, tears of joy. Uh, you said that the, the, the kids, or the young'uns and the kids were smart, articulate, engaged, but it also feel, filled me with, um, with pride actually, um, and hope and confidence about what's gonna follow us when um, um, some, of, some of us, me included, sooner rather than later shed our mortal coils. Um, Councillor Lafiso, thank you for your passion as ever and your point really you did to hit the nail on the head when you talked about it being it's about a cohort and it's about the choice um, as we know and particularly here in Aotearoa New Zealand um, many of our society don't vote for one good reason actually they're disempowered already and they have the right to vote and they are disempowered um, so let's not uh, continue that disempowerment of our young um, smart, much smart things. And Councillor Lucas, um, I, I also have a, many peers who shouldn't vote. And I'll close with my last 15 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Ackland, for your music analogy. And I'll finish by, um, by using one of the greatest uh, political songs of all time um, and say, please vote for this because, guys, the times they are are changing. Thank you. We'll take a by division. Councillor Ackland. Aye. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. No. Councillor Wiley. No. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried 10-3. Very good. And on that, we'll take a five-minute recess before we to give ourselves a break and go and get a coffee. Uh, seconded, Councillor Fiso. All those in favour say aye.
Item 24, the Emergency Management Bill submission. Ms Wakaira, do you have any prefacing comments? No, I don't. No? Thank you. Do we have any questions? <coughs> no questions. No questions. There we go. Thank you very much. All right. So, uh, that being the case, I'll move that uh, Council approves the draft uh, submission. With any amendments, no, before we do that. Sorry. One thing I note that the draft submission suggests that we want to speak to it. My advice would be that we don't. Um, and the resolutions reflect that we haven't asked for anyone to speak to it. But I think that it's such a technical submission, there's not a lot of benefit in speaking to it. Right. Well, the, uh, the motion doesn't ask for that anyway. Yeah, so yeah. there we go. So. Um, so I'm going to move that. Do I have a seconder for that, please? Councillor Walker. Would anyone like to speak to it? Councillor Vandervis. This submission is supposed to be a submission on the Emergency Management Bill. But if you read the submission, there are six paragraphs, six through to 11, that are devoted to specifically Maori inclusion Maori remuneration and co-governance. And if you look at the next two paragraphs after that, they are talking about communities that are likely to be disproportionately impacted by emergencies, um, which has become sort of second speak for Maori as well. If we are to have... Sorry, point, point of order, please, Mr Mayor. I mean, th th that last point is it's, it's a statement of fact that Maori communities because of their the location by the coast, will absolutely be disproportionately affected by emergencies. But I don't, I don't yeah, it's not a point of order. I, don't, I mean, 25 to misrepresentation, sorry. Well, I, we hadn't heard what his point was yet, actually. I, I didn't, so no, just carry on. Yes, we do. No, I'm not gonna uphold the point of order. I think we just need to get to the point <laughs> I don't, I don't see that he's misrepresenting, that the councillor is misrepresenting anything. So I'm overruling the point of order. Carry on, Councillor Vanders. My point that I was coming to is that this submission, far from actually really addressing the emergency management bill, seems to me to be disproportionately uh, concerned with Maori inclusion, Maori remuneration and co-governance, none of which um, I believe uh, are things that are representative of what the people of Dunedin would like to see in a submission. And uh, you only have to read the paragraphs from 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11 to see that. <coughs> um, for this reason, I simply can't vote for it. It's unbalanced. It's uh, not making, I think, valid points and um, not worthy of being a submission, in my view. So, uh, who else? Uh, who else is my speaker? Who else are we speaking? Who else is speaking to this? I certainly will, would like to speak to it, but obviously, Councillor Hulian. Yeah, it, I have to say, I read the submission, I Without saying thought the same, but I did wonder, there was a lot about Māori in here, but it is a, a, one question I was going to ask, but I didn't get an opportunity because I didn't put my hand up quick enough, was where it says that, um, that they wanted to make sure that Māori were reimbursed, I did think to myself, well, I hope that everyone, you know, has that opportunity, and I... While it's good for Māori to be reimbursed in an emergency situation, I was hoping that everybody did, given I've had one of my best friends lost their home in the cyclone, um, I certainly have seen the hurt and the damage that happened with that. It's absolutely devastating for everybody, um, not just certain races. Um, it, it affects everyone and impacts on everyone. Um, so I, I did wonder about some of those things as well. But 
There's no doubt about it. Sometimes Māori are more impacted than others. Um, I haven't read full statistics on how they're impacted, you know, more so than others, but sometimes maybe areas they're living in, or I don't, look, I'm not an expert on this, but anyway, that was my feeling on that. Very good. Councillor Gary. I don't know where you've all been, but right as we sit here now, there is a weather system that's hitting the east coast, and I haven't had updates, but um, certainly Maori communities who are often in coastal communities, Marae are often in coastal communities, uh, have been hugely affected by weather events of late. Um, and so I really don't know where some of you have been. And just reminding you that Marae are part of the civil defence system of providing, and in fact have done so um, in this last Cyclone Gabriel situation, of providing um, shelter and refuge for the communities. And haven't they done it well? So much manakitanga. And I recall the interviews around the reimbursement issues. Um, and I recall this too in relation to my role on the community board, the problem of um, providing the uh, necessary uh, food, water, all of those things at the time of, a, of an emergency um, and the difficulties, and I can't remember the technical, and I'm sorry I didn't ask about this in question time, but there is a pathway, but it isn't always, as I understand it, fit for purpose in these situations. So Marai went ahead and did what they needed to do in an emergency situation for them not to be re reimbursed for that or not to have a pathway to provide that financially um, is extraordinary that people would think that was okay. Uh, they have they have done an extraordinary job in terms of that manakitanga and are such an important part of our emergency responses. So I just ask people to have a little bit of a wider view and perhaps there's something you've missed. In fact, there is something you've missed in terms of being informed about this. I would urge you to support it. Councillor Fisa. Um, tenakoe, Mr. Mia. Uh, I just want to respond uh, to Councillor Vandervis's racism. Point of order. Yep. We're, we're Can I make we're my point of order? Yeah. Councillor Lalfiso has, in a recent meeting, referred to me as male, stale, pale, which is racist, sexist and ageist and wholly, wholly obnoxious and uh, I wish uh, it to be recorded that those words um, be put in the minutes. Her claim that I'm racist. Wow. Look, uh, totally you are. Hold it, hold it right here. Look, I think Object to the words, yes. and I want them to be recorded Councillor. from Councillor Lalfi. Whatever. Councillor and Councillor, just stop it right there. We're not going to have that commentary. We're not going to have uh, inflammatory adjectives. I've discussed this before. Well, so I I, I'm going to argue that th uh, this. you didn't uphold the point of order to begin with. Look, you're not going to argue with it. I'm not, I am upholding because it the was point of blatant order. racism. Look, the first the, that first speech. I am up. We're not having that. Yeah, we term are. Not. We no, are. No, we're not. We'll have an adjournment right here. Thank you. Five minutes. I uh, move and seconded. Councillor Gilbert. All those in favour, say aye.
So, uh, to recommence, as I've said, I've upheld the point of order and I'd ask Councillor Fisa to withdraw that word. Um, can you do that, please? Yep, I'll withdraw racist. Thank you. And so, uh, you were speaking, talking, speaking. Yeah, yep. please continue. Okay. Um, I just want to recall years ago, um, maybe during the 90s or early 2000s, um, when I was just a, a, a community organiser uh, in support of uh, uh, the honouring of Te Triti or Waitangi, uh, I was fortunate enough to be working on a ad hoc basis, uh, supporting um, Nicola Taylor, who was at that time the chairperson of the Otako Marae, uh, or the Otako Dunaka. And um, Ms. Taylor expressed frustration as a uh, mana whenua because many Toiwi, predominantly Pākehā organisations, because of RMA requirements, were coming to the mana whenua organisations to get sign off on their priorities and projects. Uh, and they hadn't initiated a relationship uh, before that. Uh, and so constantly, constantly, we as Tawiwi or Pākehā or mainstream organisations, we have blithely participated in the uh, disenfranchisement of tangata whenua throughout the motu. Our economy and wealth is at the level it is because of stolen Māori land. Yeah, we've given it back. Yeah, we've, we've uh, made some treaty settlements. Nevertheless, we're constantly... There is, there is some change. There is some change. And there are uh, deep relationships of trust between uh, tangata whenua and, and Pākehā. And... Um, <sighs> Over the years, there have been discussions um, in whānau and different settings uh, where young people, young um, people from Ngātamatoa, for example, uh, groups formed uh, from the first generation of young Māori uh, graduates from university they expressed frustration as to why Pākehā settlers and their whānaus did not return to their ancestral homelands in Europe. And the elders, the love of their elders for everyone, not just Māori, they said to their young people, no, the Pākehā people are needed in our society. We needed them. The vision of the Te Triti o Waitangi, which was signed by the majority of Rakatira, was a hopeful, a vision of hope that we could learn from each other. Tawiwi could learn some respect and learn some lessons of value. Um, and of course, colonization being colonization, we, Tawiwi, particularly the people who signed the, tr the other side of the treaty, the British people, just assumed that they had everything to teach and everything to take and nothing at all to learn. Hence my um, labelling of uh, uh, Council of Angeles. Whether you like it or not, we are a racist society because, I said as in the previous debate, it's about power. The power to enforce your prejudices. Every human group has got prejudices about every other human group. But we, the mainstream society, has its power 
to reinforce its prejudices against Māori. Perfectly timed, thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Councillor Lafiso, for that, um, that speech, and I, I don't want to diminish it by following it, and I will go back to the, the, the submission, um, which is about the, um, the civil defence def in the um, emergency management bill, and Councillor Gary was completely right that said that, that um, people who help should be reimbursed. I asked yesterday about the um, Local Government New Zealand and whether they were doing submissions on other things and Local Government New Zealand also support, um, our, basically our submission mirrors some of this, including um, supporting an authentic relationship provided for iwi Māori and also simplification of provisions relating to the role of iwi Māori that recognises individual councils relationships with mana whenua and that is what we are asking for in this and I also believe that um, that, that organisations should get recompensed for costs involved in emergency management. They can't just keep doing it out of the graciousness of their hearts and emptying their bowls to, to, to fill other people's bowls. They should be recompensed for that. We would do that for anyone. Um, we would hope that we would do that for anyone that looked after people in an emergency. And this is about how we, as a society, um, look after each other. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you. I will trail slightly backwards, um, and um, again, and just uh, I want to just respect and shout out um, the, the, uh, and support the commentary of uh, Councillor Lafiso and her heartfelt and passionate um, thoughts. And I fully support her thought and observations, despite having to withdraw them. Um, with Point of order. What is your point of order? Uh, I'll give you the specific one. 25.2 B language, use of disrespectful, offensive and malicious language in repeating essentially uh, what Councillor Laufiso earlier had to withdraw, referring to its withdrawal and supporting it. It's both offensive and malicious. Order, Mr. Chairman. Speak. Yeah. Speaking to look. Um, yeah, look, we'll take an adjournment because this is getting out of hand, and I think uh, seconded by the, we have a couple of minutes adjournment. Seconded, um, Deputy Mayor Lucas. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Carried. degrades the whole meeting. Now, I'd just like it to stop, and you know, you're not the only participant because uh, it is on several sides of the table. Just leave the inflammatory adjectives out of it, and leave out subtle references to those, or disguised references to those too, please. You can make your point without getting into inflammatory and provocative dialogue. 
Are you able to continue? T totally. Um, and I'll continue with where I left off, which wasn't actually saying anything inflammatory, but let's move on. Um, we were getting back to the end of my point there around supporting the previous um, uh, Councillor Lafiso speech. Um, and a reference towards that um, in a non-inflammatory way. Um, we were told, if you remember, um, fellow councillors yesterday around this table uh, when we were talking about cruise ships that actually it was, it was pointed out to us that the Otako uh, Marae would actually and absolutely be supportive of and we would be used as a support centre uh, in the event of, a, of an emergency for the, crew, for the cruise ships. Um, um, how, how ironic, eh? Um, I, as I often do here, I, I, and I, I bypass Wikipedia and go straight to, to Google, which also has its problems too. But I typed in the words, uh, are Marai disproportionately affected by climate change? And go figure, eh? A plethora of information pops out of me, and that information emanates from esteemed sources like the Ministry of Environment, Landscape Research, NIWA, the World Meteorologi Meteorological uh, Foundation, the list goes on. And I'll read a, a little bit from the, from the land, the, the land um, co co escape research uh, document, um, which was, is interesting reading and a couple of bits in, in, in quotes. Climate change not only threatens the tangible components of Maori well-being, but also the spiritual components and, most important, the well-being of future generations. And further on it says, and again in quotes, evidence suggests climate-related adverse health impacts are expected to become more severe and be borne disproportionately by groups like Maori who already suffer health inequalities. So um, going back to, um, if I can not be inflammatory, to Councillor Van der Visser's, uh, commentaries about that disproportionality, it's clear there in peer-reviewed evidence-based research papers. So um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll leave it there, otherwise I'm going to get, get myself in some terribly, terribly hot water, I think. Thank you. I think it's last, so I shall have some final comments. Uh, so I actually agree with Councillor Vandervis that this submission is uh, very um, significantly about Māori. And it is very rightly so, because I agree with Councillor Gary that Māori are very disproportionately affected, and Marae are typically used for emergency management all around the country. Now, no one expects the owner of a private helicopter or a, a commercial helicopter who comes to the rescue of people and or transports people to safety uh, not to be able to put in a bill for their expenses in an emergency. And, you know, that is just expected. And it's so should it be for Marae because, you know, it's really obvious that the best facilities that we have throughout this country for housing or, you know, bedding a large number of people and feeding and providing warmth and shelter to a large number of people in an emergency Amarai because they are typically used to host hui and wananga and a whole lot of other group gatherings. And so we are very blessed to have that facility. We should absolutely not take that facility for granted and we should absolutely compensate appropriately for use of that facility, not only with their thanks, but with the costs and and the you know the a realistic price to be paid. You know, it should not be just expected as volunteers, just as we don't expect, um, you know, helicopter pilots to run their helicopter and do all this for nothing because they cannot. And, and just similarly, by the similar, by the same logic, Marais cannot fund the um, the regular rescues of people in um, dire states of emergency. And Lord knows we're having quite a number of emergencies around the country lately, and there are more on the horizon and just in this last few days. You know, 
the East Coast is once again on the receiving end of you know, inclement weather. And once again, you know, marae will be called upon. It is critically important that they, um, they are compensated adequately. And also their communities who are on the receiving end, it's really important that you know, their, their communities are more adversely affected by these weather events than others. So that also needs to be recognised and raised in terms of profile and appreciation and remediation. So having said that, I'll put the, um, put the motion by division. Councillor Acklin. Aye. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried 12 1. The next item, 25, is the traffic and parking bylaw review. So, yeah, it'd be nice to have a non contentious item for a change. However, um, I welcome <laughs> Mr. Mr. Ward and Ms. Benson to the stand. Do you have any preliminary comments? No, I'm happy to take it as read. Stand. Do we have any questions? Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, thank you. Um, in point number 19 on page 240, you talk about um, community engagement in April 2024 and consultation between May and June 2024. Um, I'm just a little concerned about consultation fatigue next year. And I mean, I'm, a, I'm aware that this is a 2010, the bylaws, you know, has been around for a very long time. And I'm just wondering about the timing of that consultation in relation to all the other consultation and community engagement that's planned for a similar period? Um, we are aware of the conflicts and we're doing the best to manage them, but it's about manage, we've got to accommodate various statutory requirements. But we do have um, a timetable of consultation that we do try and manage things that are non-statutory. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for this paper. Um, my overriding feeling reading this is since 2010, when this was first done, is that the major changes are really and likely to be increasing actually are in that tech space. Is that, is that really my reading? Yes, and I guess in, in, in our policy space, and plus the tidy up of, of kind of relevant legislation around it, yeah. We have exhausted questions. Thank you. So, um, I'd like to move that we approve the commencement of the traffic and parking bylaw and determine that a bylaw is the most appropriate way to address issues relating to traffic management and parking in Dunedin. Do I have a seconder for that, Deputy Mayor Lucas? Now, who would like to? Do we have any speakers? Councillor Benson Pope? No speaker. No. Any other? No other speakers? In which case, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No, Carried. recorded, please. Ah, very good. You got to give us a result. What? Uh, number 26 is next. Happy to move. It is where so uh, Councillor Vandervis has moved. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Acklin. I presume there was no questions. Does, would anyone like do you have a question? If I'm able to answer it, ask it at this point. Yes. So, so I didn't quite see the con I know private ways are not of as much of a concern in terms of the policy, but I didn't quite understand the Vandis connection with the family. That wasn't explained. The other name, the second alternative name was explained, but that wasn't, I, or I missed it. Sure. 
Um, forgive me if I yes. missed it, um, Ms Benson, but... Um, So, Councillor, yes, um, it, um, it's the the references in uh, um, item uh, paragraph ten, um, referencing the family of the developer, um, and you're right in saying that private ways uh, give less um, weight to the criteria and the road naming policy. Um, yeah. I still don't quite. Un so, is Van just the surname? It, it wasn't. It was suggested that. Um, Anagrams amalgamation of the derivatives. Is it a derivative of the developer's family's name? I, I believe it is uh, referencing the, the, the surname of the developer, uh, develop, developer's family. I'd have to find out, Councillor. Can I? It's Van der Water. If you look on the, on the aerial photograph, it's on the bottom. The surname is Van der Water. on page 271. Does that cover your question sufficiently? I have a Councilor secondary Gary? question, um, again related to one of the men in the family, and this seems to get perpetuated, um, and I'm wondering what progress we're making in terms of encouraging developers to choose differently? Um, there is a report in draft that has um, proposes some additions to the road naming register that um, looks to add some um, women's names, but that wasn't ready for this agenda. Thank you for that. We still have that problem, don't we, of history being male dominated and then that perpetuating through the choice. Thank you. So do we have any more questions? That's a no. And we don't have any, thank you. So we don't have any more, uh, we don't have any comments, any speakers, you want to have a, sp okay. So Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, and while this doesn't, it isn't a high priority in terms of the policy because it's a private way versus a public road, um, as I've just mentioned, we continue to have this problem of, of uh, male-dominated names because they're reflecting history and on and on it goes. And I will welcome that report when it comes. I want to acknowledge in the audience, though, a member of the public um, who I met when the first and only name uh, of... Uh, reflecting the Polish community um, was open just at the bottom of um, his property and I uh, thank him for um, his manakitanga on that day when the Polish community celebrated that really important um, inclusion. So I would just encourage us to find a way to um, encourage our developers to think a little more laterally. It will help with having a m more diverse range of names, be it uh, diversity in gender, ethnicity, um, so that we can start and reflect that in our in our in the choosing of names for, for our streets around Dunedin. But um, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Very good. So at this point, I'll put the motion. All those in favour of approving the name, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. So we've got two things happening. Uh, the annual report is likely to be quite a, um, a lengthy discussion and question time. Uh, and we have people coming for that uh, after lunch, and lunch is coming at 12. So let's move to item 29, proposed event road closures, December 23 to February 24. That's item 29 on your agenda. So... Uh, Happy to move. Yes, do we have... Are there any questions for staff of that? No. Sorry? 
Abbey second, uh, Councillor Walker, but there are no questions of staff, in which case, would anyone like to speak to this? Okay, so uh, I'll put the motion. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Now, I think the other two annual reports I think will be very lengthy. So I think it is probably just as well to break for lunch early, but we'll come back a little bit earlier. So can we resume? It's well, I don't think we could get started. Yeah, it's not a bit of a problem. So, uh, but what time are the staff coming? Are they 12.30? Can they? So um, Mr. Cooper is available from 12.30 and Mr. Allen is available now. So um, quarter to one probably. Or half past 12, whatever. When's lunch arriving? Is it here? Yep. So maybe 12.30? Uh, let's aim for 12.30. Seconded. Councillor Viso, all those in favour say aye. aye. Carried.
We need a chief. Sorry for my tardiness, Mr. Mayor. Right. Uh, let us get back underway. I was wondering if we could go into the meeting, and then move an adjournment because we've just got new papers on our um, on our desks while we were away, which some yes. of us actually haven't had time to read. And it's the auditor's opinion. Is that the plan for this sure. afternoon? Uh, well, I mean, it's a good it's, idea. It's, it's sound. Yeah, it's a good idea that we. Uh, have a read of these papers, the independent auditors report, etc. So, because we were scheduled to start at uh, twelve thirty, so there's possibly viewers out there expecting, so they they need to know what's happening. So we'll reopen the meeting, and you're moving that we adjourn for ten minutes or so, or adjourn, adjourn till quarter two, to give us time to read the papers. So we'll resume at twelve forty-five. Uh, do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Ackland, all those in favour say aye. aye. Carried.
So, we are ready to go. Got our seats before we, before we get to 12.46. Thank you. So, let's resume the meeting. And um, we're on to item 27, the DCC annual report for the year ending 30 June 2023. So we have Ms. Allen and Ms. Graham at the table. Do you have any uh, prefacing comments? And Ms. Ms. Bodecker. So, any comments to start, please? Um, yes, so in terms of the, um, there has been a a schedule of updates um, that we've made since the um, agenda was circulated. Um, so there is one change to the financial statements there related to um, the group, to City Forests. Other than that, um, the financial statements are unchanged. Um, in terms of what's changed since the June um, management report to Council in August, um, we indicated in that report that we had um, three significant things to uh, still to do, so revaluation effects, um, the landfill provision and vested assets. Um, so those changes um, have obviously flowed through now, so the, the, the net deficit for the council has increased um, from 26 million to uh, 36 million. Um, so the main changes there um, vested assets is an increase in revenue, so, so that's a positive change. Um, the investment property portfolio reduced in value, so that's um, a reduction of 11.2 million. And then the provision for the um, Green Island landfill is an increase in costs of 3 million. And I would just add that while we've run a deficit budget, the cash flow position is still strong. Um, and a number of the things that have um, led to the deficit are non-cash items. It doesn't mean that it hasn't been a particularly challenging financial year for the council, as it has been for everyone, with inflationary pressures built into a range of our operating costs. And we are seeing now, as we prepare for the 10-year plan, some of the challenges we face if we're going to start to move the budget back towards being a balanced budget. Okay, uh, so now, time. question time. Who do we have? Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I noticed a number of things in, in the report and I sent an email through with some of those questions which have been addressed, but I also wonder in the um, the next steps discussion, etc., it doesn't seem to have a bit for errors to be fixed or the, the the chief executive to use their discretion to change some of the things in the report. Is it still possible to change? Um, there was the, I guess it was the fatal and serious crashes that was the biggest issue that I noticed. Um, I have checked on those numbers that you raised with our audit, with our auditors and in fact that number is correct. Um, the comparative in the 2021-22 year was incorrect. Oh, I'll just ask some general questions, I guess, because it is the annual report. Um, so it's just about the, I guess, the readability of the report. Um, Pages 12 and 13 last year, there were 35 bullet points of DCC achievements, and this year there's like seven paragraphs um, right at the start. And this is the extraneous stuff that the auditor, I guess, um, says in the report, not so interested in, but it is the stuff that the public are interested in. And the reply I got said that um, the bullet points are actually through the report, but I did wonder if it's just because it is a um, 
the auditor doesn't care so much about how we present the reports, whether those achievements can be moved to the front. We don't think that we can change them this time. What I would add, though, um, we had a discussion at Audit and Risk about our approach to the annual report and to readability, and uh, I agree that it is it is quite um, an intense and, and difficult read, and so we have committed to looking at a new process for how we present this information next time. Um, I know that doesn't solve the immediate problem of this time, but I think readability of the annual report is a really important thing, and I think we have never... Um, really focused on it being a, a key document that we communicate our achievements um, with to the community and it, that will change. We've got um, a new CFO and we've just appointed a new staff member to help run the annual report. It's an ideal opportunity to look at a changed approach. Sorry. Sorry, um, page 31, I just wanted to um, just explore the, because I don't think we've had a report through to the Economic Development um, sorry, Economic Development Committee, about the film permits, and it mentions that um, this year there were 21 film permits versus last year was 43, and I wonder if there was an explanation about why the number had um, halved. I'll just find that answer. Uh, I believe it was a change in regs, but let me just check. Do you have it in front of you? It was in the... Oh, there we are. The main reason um, was the drop, <coughs> the screen produ production rebate for both international and domestic productions was under review during the year, and that caused some anxiety in the industry and put projects on hold until the new regulations were announced on 31 July 2023. So paraphrasing, does that mean that national regulations made it such that local film productions were affected? There was a degree of anxiety until the um, national framework was um, clarified. Okay, my next one is just about um, some of the measures, and we are like within a percent of some of the, um, the levels of service measurement, and when we look at the a residents' opinion survey, the margin of error is 2.6%, and beside a lot of these things we have not achieved, and I would consider that the margin of error would make it actually that these things were achieved. Um, are they, do, they, do we decide that, or would the Auditor General ping us if we were within 1% of achieving? So I agree with you, um, but unfortunately we're required to, have, um, to meet what it says, so the auditors look to, for the exact measure. And, and so that is one of the reasons we are looking as part of the work we're doing on the levels of service to change what measures we use so that we actually use measures that are a fairer assessment of whether we've achieved that level of service performance. Um, my next question is around the cycle counters. Um, that is page 64 in that there were... Um, the cycle, average cycle count movements has fallen by nearly a quarter, 24%. Um, and you sent me some information about where the counters are and what they'd counter. And I just wondered if there was actually any explanation of the, if anyone knew the reasons behind the fall in those numbers. Because it looks like they're actually done over a, um, a, a not quite a number of counting days. Um, so I'm quite, I want, I don't know. Dave, do you know the answer to that? Um, not here. No, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a detailed answer for that, um, Councillor. Because it's counterintuitive where the percentage of residents who walk, jog, cycle or take public transport to work, or oh, maybe it's not that counterintuitive, has risen from, I think, 17% to 21%, but I guess that public transport's put in there, so... Theorising, maybe there's a switch from cycling to public transport. I just wanted to dig that out because obviously we invest invest in cycle transport. Was the weather worse? <laughs> I don't know. I think that's um. And and just the I don't because I don't think people are going to be able to answer that. Well, just about the fatal and serious crashes. So the data, the year before was incorrect, and the fatal ones, but the fatal and serious crashes have gone up 17 from the previous year. Is that correct? That's correct. So the correct number is 41. 
Okay, thank you. I think that's all my questions at the moment. Can I just ask a question on that question, Councillor Barker? The correct number is 41. You're talking about um, DSI injuries. Uh, yes, yeah, because it was incorrect the previous year, so I had taken, there were 33 the previous year reported in our annual report, plus the 17 more, and I had gone, is that 50? Because we had 41 in the front of our report, so the correct number is 41. Right, which so is 17 more than last year. Yep. And last year was 12 fewer than the year before. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So we've had a dip and then back up. Yeah, COVID. So a COVID dip probably. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Get people safe. <laughs> yes, I just wanted to get some clarity on that. Thank you. Uh, next question is uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Uh, thank you. Um, firstly, some questions in relation to the um, auditor's report. So the qualification, um, the first qualification in relation to the three waters um, infrastructure assets and the valuation and the third qualification in relation to the timeframes for processing building consent applications, they in theory should drop off next year because they're actually qualifications that relate to 2022, not the current year. That's correct. Thank you, and actually, um, Mr. Allen, he may be able to answer this. And thank you for for being online. The um, the paragraph in relation to the emphasis of matter over the uncertainty over the water services reform program are all councils getting that emphasis of matter in the audit report this year because of the the current, uh, I guess, political situation that we're in. Thank you for that. Um, I appreciate that. Um, and then a particular question in relation to page 98 of the um, annual report, um, where we talk about the where it shows the the surplus for the for the core council um, of a loss of let's call it 30, 36 million dollars, um, as opposed to a budget of 8.7 million. So if we take out the um, non-cash items of depreciation and amortisation. Effectively, it's a $20 million loss over budget from from where we were budgeted in terms of our um, actual cash expenses. Is that is that correct in my reading? Yes, our expenses were over budget. Um, and maybe you could just expand on that. Were, were there particular areas where um, we were particularly over budget during the year? Um, so... Um, we reported up in, in August, um, we had um, increased maintenance in transport, um, so s there was some emergency works, um, there was also the traffic lights in Mosgiel um, that needed to be, because they're not our asset, that, that couldn't be capital expenditure, um, so some of that is, some of the extra maintenance is um, subsidised. Um, there is increased expenditure in economic development. Um, and the funding for that came from the grants, so that was all unbudgeted. Um, there was increased maintenance in um, three waters. Um, does that answer your question? Mr Mayor, perhaps I could uh, just add to that. Uh, De Deputy Mayor, it's also important to understand the, the expenses, and, and this is a, a strange quirk in accounting, uh, includes the uh, 11.3 million uh, write down in investment properties uh, and also the 3 million increase in the uh, landfill uh, aftercare provision. Both of those are non cash as, as well as the depreciation and amortisation that you pointed out in your question. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Yes, that is correct. Very good. Uh, Councillor Fiso. Um, just like to acknowledge uh, 
the sleepless nights that you've had uh, wrangling all this and then uh, acknowledging um, all the mahi, the flurry of mahi one of the uh, auditors' reports come through. Um, I have seen through a number, just a small number of minor typos um, and that leads me to ask um, CEO Graham, do we have a dedicated team, maybe two or three people, who actually get to proofread everything before it comes out? We do not, but um, we will be looking at how we ensure a consistency to our public facing documents as part of the um, review that I've been doing around our comms and our marketing and in terms of how we deliver some of these key documents. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I've got um, two more questions. Um, and sorry, I've got the, I can't find the right page number, but it's about explanations, um, numbers two and three on levels of service on building consents. And it's possibly covered in some way by the auditor's report, but noticing that um, 2,158 of uh, 2,322 consents were um, met on time, remaining four that fell outside the regulatory time frame, what happened to, whether they're just a little bit out or? Uh, thank you, Councillor. The, yeah, they are primarily a little bit out. There's a chunk of them at 21 days, 22 days. Um, there may be the odd one that goes 30 plus days, but they're few and far between. Thank you. Um, and just, I, I am, um, my final question or comment is uh, cognizant of um, CEO Graham's response to Councillor Barker about minor editorial things. Um, and this is about uh, on page 27 in our community, um, meeting our community, working with our community, uh, some of our achievements for the 22, uh, 23 year. And the, uh, it's just, I mean, it's too late to change, but I just want to emphasize in terms of the hui for the former refugee community, it was the first that we've ever held, um, having been, uh, uh, you know, having been a refugee city for seven years, we felt it was really important to go back to the community. And uh, so I just say, if you can celebrate that. And, this, and similarly with the um, other one that talks about uh, event organising and says we work with external event organisers, please, if we can just say we're working in partnership to support our community, and there and you identify a range of specific um, events, and there's two that are Samoan, so uh, could you please say maybe Moana Nui? Well, I don't know, but you know. And I will um, respond to the question that was in that about could we do better? And I, and I think that is what we're signalling that we haven't. I think we've always historically focused on the annual report as about being about the numbers and about the budgets, and that's really really important. But it is an opportunity to celebrate with our and share with our community the things we've done well, the challenges we've had, and how we might do better. And we haven't taken that opportunity. We're looking at how we might do that from now on. But it, unfortunately. I acknowledge what you're saying. We should have celebrated that differently. We will next time. Councillor Walker. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'll start with the typo first. Um, on page 21, 22, I presume the um, reference to elective vehicles means electric. Yep, okay, cool. That, was a, that wasn't an amusing one for me. Um, and in terms of, and this might be for the CEO, and I think you've, we've, you've touched on it already in a couple of answers, and I'm probably speaking on behalf here of Councillor Houlihan and Councillor Acklin, and me as the third constituent of the Levels of Service 10-year plan, working groups, a very long title. It's quite hard reading this in the context of seeing what's potentially coming in this, and I kept thinking, have I misread something? So maybe just, just can you, a, a short explanation as to why we're doing that and what it, yeah, and the importance of doing that in terms of fairer 
for measures. So, as has been noted, um, some of the levels of service require a ROS satisfaction rate of 95%, and we've done 94%, which is within the margin of error of ROS, but fails audit, so it means it's a non-achieved level of service, and that doesn't in our minds accurately reflect um, how we've achieved in those areas. So there's a work, work stream as part of the 10-year plan to review what we want to be measuring and how we want to be measuring it. And that um, we've got a workshop likely to be the first public workshop we have actually on levels of service coming up which will um, help us frame that conversation for our community about what, and really we need to be asking them, what. What do you want us to be measuring so we can um, look at how well we're succeeding? So that, that's why. The measures weren't looked at as part of the last 10-year plan or the one before that. I think they might even have been the same measures for some areas from when Councillor Lucas was a member of staff. So that's how they're, they're old. So it's well overdue for a review. Thank you. And I know that meeting will be robust um, and interesting. Uh, two more questions. Um, in terms of um, the landfill costs are going up... Um, like plus three million and the investment portfolio minus 11.2, I think you said. What is the number for the increased revenue from the vested assets, if you don't mind me asking? Um, it was 2.3 million. Um, thank you for that. And final question for now. Um, on page 127, when we talk about um, other financial assets, and we list, obviously, Waipuri Fund, um, borrow notes, etc. Um, what, what is is what is other shares? Is that shares in subsidiaries? And if it's not, what are they? Is that four hundred and eighty-one? Yeah. I, I don't need an answer now. If I'll come back to you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Oh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, turning to Mr Allen, if I may, to ask a question. Um, I was interested, Mr Allen, because you have an overview and uh, an ability to compare with other councils, if you'd have any comments in relation to the um, independent auditor's report and our annual report in relation to uh, how other councils uh, are going this year. Uh, through you, Mayor. Th th thank you, Councillor Gary. Um, I, I, th I think other councils, uh, many of them are not going to make uh, the statutory deadline uh, on today. Uh, and just to remind councillors that this is the uh, first year out of three uh, where we are back to the normal uh, regulatory uh, requirement of finalising the annual report by the 31st of October. Is, uh, many, many councils uh, are not going to make that uh, again. Uh, so uh, you know, I pass on my congratulations to uh, Chief Executive and particularly the finance team and not to, not to overlook the auditors and, and, the, and the work that's been done to uh, achieve this uh, result. It's been a really difficult year for the sector uh, again. Uh, even, even though uh, last year was our, our re, uh, revaluation cycle for the uh, three water assets infrastructure, uh, it did require looking at the valuation again, and you'll see in the annual report that those assets uh, predominantly moved up by another 80 million. Uh, so uh, this is just uh, the reflection on uh, uh, inflation pressures on replacement costs. So, you know, the whole sector has had uh, a real challenge in, uh, in relation to valuation of uh, three water assets. And some of those other areas drawn uh, or qualified in the audit opinion uh, around the, uh, particularly around the complaints process uh, with water issues, uh, that is quite a common qualification, quite a common issue uh, throughout uh, local, uh, local government. So, you know, there are a number of aspects uh, in here that are fairly uh, similar to, uh, to the, the setback. And I have a follow In general, in general uh, Dunedin City Council can be very proud of achieving the deadline today 
uh, and, the, and the standard uh, of uh, their annual report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Allen. I have a follow-up question, and that is around, um, interested again in your overview and observations, around the trajectory with qualifications, and I appreciate the comments you've made so far around that, but um, I know I have a level of frustration with the, um, the, the detailed nature of it, um, weighing up that the auditors have a job to do, certainly, but uh, each year I observe that they it gets just more, might I say, pedantic um, and uh, and the cost of audit goes up by the year as well. Just putting aside the cost for a moment and just thinking about those qualifications, what other comments would you have to make about them and the trends? Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr Mayor, thank you, uh, Councillor Gary. Uh, you'll recall at our last uh, audit risk subcommittee meeting, uh, I made the comment that the number of qualifications, we have four this year, uh, but as uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Lucas has pointed out, two of those only relate to the comparatives. But the audit report is getting quite messy. It's quite difficult to read. Uh, and uh, we've got a work stream within audit and risk where we're going to sort of look at and see if we can't eliminate those uh, qualifications uh, as part of uh, the exercise that the Chief Executive mentioned uh, of, uh, of re-looking uh, at the annual report. And, and I know everybody concerned feels uh, much the same way as you, Councillor Gary, uh, is, is that there are a number of minor issues in there that have been raised by the auditors. Uh, and uh, we, we will work with management uh, over the next 12 months to see if they can be eliminated in future order reports. And my final um, final question to you, Mr. Allen, again, it's helpful to have that comparison and overview, is the comments that the Chief made around uh, re-looking at our annual report and how it's presented, and um, certainly while we all agree the figures are important, um, the text uh, gives a, an extraordinary picture and it's an opportunity to celebrate achievements. Um, would you have any comments around uh, the, the possible... Um, or other kinds of presentations uh, or any comments you'd have to um, about the presentation of the format of the annual report? Through you again, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Gary. Uh, I strongly support this exercise. Uh, you know, I, the the uh, annual report, as the Chief Executive has indicated, is a very uh, powerful uh, communication document uh, as, uh, as part of what's been achieved. Uh, you know, the, the, the numbers and the financial statements are only one part of it. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, 204 pages, uh, it is a very difficult read. Uh, and, the, and the use of sort of modern technology, infographics and uh, case studies and, and pictures, uh, many councils throughout New Zealand are moving in that direction, strongly support it, very timely. Thank you. Councillor Vandivis. Um, current questions basically just focusing on the independent auditors report, the um, few pages that we've just been given us uh, uh, less than an hour ago. Um, the qualified opinion this time uh, is qualified as I read it uh, because of an issue over the revaluation of three waters uh, as an infrastructure asset and the auditor couldn't have confidence in uh, whether the valuation was materially correctly stated. Is that something that you expect to be resolved next time round? In terms of the same kind of qualification that we had last year, I believe over the stadium valuation that time, um, or was it the year before, uh, has, have there been any stadium revaluation issues this time round, or have they been sorted? They, I don't see them here in the independent auditor's report they have been there previously. There certainly wasn't a stadium one last time, um, and I would have to um, go back 
in my memory banks. That might be a question for Mr Cooper when you come to the company's reports. But there's no stadium impact on our annual report. Okay. Um, it says uh, on the uh, not numbered one, two, three, four, fourth page of the auditor's uh, summary that we've just um, received um, that the um, that, that there were counting complaints and that the complete records of all complaints made to the City Council were not available. Is there a reason why complete records weren't available? Are they not usually collated? This is, again, an historic one from the year before relating to how we categorised and counted things, mostly the ones that came in through the Palmerston North Call Centre. It has been remedied or will be remedied, but it's a carryover because it was comparing this year with last year. So this was a comparison issue relating to last year rather than incomplete records for complaints this year? There was a period of time this year where there were incomplete records as well, but my advice is that it has been resolved and won't be recurring. OK. Um, the um, yeah, Going uh, on the next page, um, City Council was unable to explain the reason for these differences or to qualify the effects of differences and this is talking about the accuracy of traffic counts, traffic count data and the issue of um, quality of rides, smooth roads. So the, the, there was a single staff member responsible for um, entering the data? that staff member worked for us for a relatively short period of time. Because of that, we were unable <coughs> to then verify the information that was put in when asked by audit. So that won't be, that won't be a problem next time either? No. And um, the final question on the, the, the auditor's um, brief here. Um, he mentions a number of times the ability of the DCC to continue as a going concern. Um, and on his penultimate page says um, uh, that our conclusions based on the report evidence up to date, uh, are, uh, sorry, our conclusions are based on the auditor's report. He says, however, uh, future events or conditions may cause the City Council and the group to cease to continue as a going concern. Do you know of any specific reasons why um, this might be offered? Uh, is there a particular risk or audit issue going forward that might um, cause the Dunedin City Council and group to cease as a going concern? Nothing that I'm aware of. Mr. Mayor, maybe uh, I can help out uh, in, in yes. this regard. Yes, please. Uh, Council of Andalus, uh, this is standard wording, uh, and re really what it's drawing the uh, attention of the reader to is that this is a historical document, and the auditor's assessment of going concern uh, is at a particular date. Uh, being today when he has signed uh, the audit report uh, and uh, he's just drawing attention to the fact that uh, going concern is always uh, uh, subject to future events. So it's, uh, it's very standard wording. There would be nothing specific in his mind uh, in relation to the Newton City Council. Great. I'm glad to hear that that's just a, a generic um, coverall that uh, seems to have been put in there. And I'm, I'm further heartened, um, particularly by the last line, where um, uh, I think I can just quote the last bit. If, based on our work, we conclude that there is a, that there is a material misstatement of this information, we are required to report that fact. And he says we have nothing to report in this regard. So it would seem that the auditor is uh, entirely happy that... Um, the facts or the data that he's been given are actually materially correct. 
I have other questions, but I thought um, if I'd give someone else a go, I can go back to other parts of the annual report. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, thank you. And um, maybe, Mr Allen, this might be a question for you in relation to the audit fees that are detailed on page 111. Um, where I note that not only for the core council but also for the group, and I'm sure Mr Cooper, who's here from Dunedin City Holdings, has a view, um, where they've gone up um, ballpark 50% over the comparative from last year. Um, and I do know that it is um, a challenging area to recruit auditors, and it is challenging. And even as you and Councillor Gary talked earlier about looking, for, looking to, to simplify the report, Audit, uh, annual report in the future, um, that's not going to reduce our audit fee in any which way. And is there any way that we, you know, 50 per, any one contractor increasing their prices by 50% in one year is is um, pretty challenging? And it's um, just, is there any way that we can uh, address that? Uh, through you, Mayor, again, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Uh, it's, it's a major issue uh, and uh, I'm afraid I don't have any uh, silver bullet. Uh, we will have to continue to negotiate. Uh, it's an, it, another issue that uh, plagues the sector. Um, I, I think what's uh, uh, clearly driven such a massive increase, and you refer to as 50%, uh, is uh, that Audit New Zealand uh, held their charges uh, over a number of years. Uh, and uh, there's a significant amount of backlog or catch up uh, within uh, these figures. Uh, and uh, again, I stress that it's a sector wide issue. Uh, it's, it's also um, not only in the local government or uh, the public sector, right throughout uh, all business entities in New Zealand, uh, order charges are going up at a rate much greater than inflation. Thank you. Very good. Um, I have a couple of uh, questions. On page 112, uh, there's the other expenses uh, chart there, or table of other expenses. The bottom one is other expenditure. Other expenses, 135 million, which seems a lot to have no um, designation on it, no characterisation on it, whereas the other expenses in that column are much, well, relatively small. Do we know what that $135 million was for? Uh, yes, Mr Mayor. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the breakdown um, that you receive in your management um, accounts monthly is um, you get a breakdown of op operations and maintenance, occupancy and consumables in general. So of that number, um, this 89 million is operations and maintenance, so um, that's transport, three waters, all, all council. Um, the occupancy costs are, are 31 million, um, so ma the 13 million of that is rates, um, but we've also got insurance, electricity, and cleaning in there. Um, and then there's consumables in general that you get reported up as well, um, and that's where we have our IT costs, consultants, um, advertising, um, Ministry of, for the Environment levies. Right. So we, we've undertaken to um, break that down in a lot more detail, or not to have that other category uh, for next year's annual report. Yes. Well. It's a bit disproportionate to the size of the other the, the categories listed. Anyway, that's fine. Thank you. Um, on page 93, we have the amount of um, waste that is diverted, which is a very low number compared to the rest of New Zealand, I believe. But our target is to increase it by 70% or 270 cent by 2030. And... Um, we're not doing particularly well on that, but if we look over to uh, another page, we have got a number. Where is it? Oh, I've lost it. The the waste minimisation reserve on page one hundred and twenty-one. Uh, we've got a million dollars 
in the waste minimisation reserve uh, that we haven't used, which seems like a bit of a discrepancy to me. So we could have been purposing that money to diverting waste or minimisation, minimising waste. So we've got a nice reserve, but um, not a good performance. How do we resolve? How do we? What? Why is that? Might not, it might be a question for the chief. Uh, they kind. I think they're not related. So the yeah. the waste diversion um, level of service, and that, that's being reviewed as part of the the level of service work that we're doing alongside the waste minimisation plan, the million or so dollars. And what page was that on, Mr Mayor? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, page 121, one, two, one, uh, third last line yep. of the waste minimisation reserve. Uh, and I'm sorry, the, that level of detail, I'm, I think mm. that is something that we are using potentially for capital items that have been subject to a council decision um, recently. Right on. Very good. Uh, at least they have a purpose that, to do yeah. with our waste. Yeah, in, in the waste area. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> That's good. And um, there is an item, a couple of items of, um, well, essentially it's emanating from uh, Ros reports of things that aren't um, items of dissatisfaction. Uh, where was I looking? That I was one very low to do with city parking. Are we allocating any money, or what uh, are we doing about that? Yeah, because it remains, you know, a very low area of customer satisfaction in terms of our residents. So the parking management work is due to come to council. Dave might not know exactly, but that is a piece of work that's underway and will. Um, be presented to council um, over the next over the coming months. I just I can't recall off the top of my head, Mr. Mayor, which meeting it's scheduled for. Right, good. Um, and page forty-five. Um, you know, as we know, there's been quite a lot of interest in public toilets, and a lot of uh, submissions on that. And we have a plan for that. But uh, the changing places toilet in the central city area was due. Uh, by 30th of June last year, and as of 30th of June this year, it's still not done, I don't believe. So when will it be done? Uh, be I can't tell you exactly when it will be done, but there were um, supply issues with the component parts for it due to COVID that delayed everything, and then there's been some technical challenges with um, the work on designing the site um, yeah. that are still being resolved, and because it's also near, um, it's in Mori Place, it was we couldn't do the work um, with some of that work that was happening on George Street, Murray Place and Falul without um, shutting the network down entirely. So we had to make sure that we could still have traffic flow for the rest of the city while that work, so that work hasn't progressed in part for that reason. Right. Thank you. Now, Councillor Vandervis, you had further questions? Yes, thank you. Um, I've, I was very concerned in 2019 when we went for an unbalanced budget and that uh, appears on our page 172 in, in, the, in, the, in the bottom graph and that was when in terms of revenue over expenditure we were running at um, you know just a, a bit under 100 percent. Um, this year we're running well under at 89 percent and um, the main reason for the significantly unbalanced budget has been suggested that uh, that's because we've had this massive increase in capital spending. Um, however, when I, when I look at what spending we have done, uh, most of the spending, um, it's been claimed that there was like an extra $120 million of accelerated capital spending, most of that spending to me would appear simply to be um, maintenance. Uh, uh, you know, you're talking replacing pipes, you're talking, um, you know, re replacing this, that and the next thing. What 
percent, what, what really is the major capital spend that isn't repairs and maintenance that is being given as the reason for this um, particularly worrying unbalanced budget? Um, just to clarify that, Councillor Vandervis, the, the main difference there this year is the increased depreciation. Um, so depreciation is $29 million greater than, than last year, um, as well as that we have the f that fair value loss on our investment property um, portfolio of $11 million. So they're the two main differences this year. Okay, but that's still only $50 million. Are you saying that they were unbudgeted and the reason we now have an unbalanced budget? Uh, they were unbudgeted, but that, that depreciation increase is included in our budget uh, for the current year, so our current year budget has a, has a deficit. In terms of making sure that we don't get ourselves in an unbalanced budget situation again, um, especially with continuing high interest rates, where we appear at this stage at least to be borrowing to pay interest, amongst other things. Um, what significant changes are going to be made to ensure we don't have an unbalanced budget again next year? Well, that will be the focus of the 10-year plan. And so it will be a, a matter of um, council laws in discussion and consultation with your community deciding on what the priorities are. Um, because we do need to work out how to get the um, budget balanced. At the same time, um, the community has aspirations for things other than um, repairs and maintenance. So that will be for council to grapple with some of those decisions. Those other main um, potential uh, costs that the, the, the um, public uh, apparently want um, in terms of capital, are you talking uh, or are you thinking of, for instance, the um, new theatre, um, black box or otherwise, uh, as being one of the capital items? And what other major capital items do you see on the horizon? What should I be worried about? Well, I worry about everything, but I'm not sure what you should be worried about, Councillor. I think it would be wrong to signal out any one or other capital project at the minute. Councillors are going to need to take a range of um, views into account and look at um, what you prioritise. To my mind, we have an obligation around pipes, roads, infrastructure that we already own, and making sure that it is fit for purpose. <coughs> After that, they're, they're um, decisions that councillors are going to have to make. Right, but the pipes, uh, roads, etc., they're basically repairs and maintenance. We don't have massive uh, population increase requiring a lot of capital there. Um, in terms of things that aren't repairs and maintenance, um, and the reason these are the ones I worry about is because I think these are the ones that we could possibly have some decisions on that may get us back into the black or not. Um, it, it, the capacity that we have for capital projects as such um, from this annual report as I read it is very limited and is there any uh, way that you see that capacity being increased in the next year? If I may Mr Mayor, um, and I have to be careful here because these are conversations we've yet to have and so it's very hard to, to comment in any detail because we need to be providing, have fully considered things and be providing council with advice to make some of these decisions. It's likely that the capital budgets will come to council at the December meeting, where you will start then to see um, what the suite of likely projects are and what the renewals are. I, I, and I don't want to disagree with you, but I don't necessarily think that it's correct to characterise um, the pipes and the roads as just renewals. And, and remembering also that we're not fully funding renewals. And so this council took the decision that we would um, not fully fund depreciation for our existing assets. So already there's an issue there. And at the same time, we have 
we do have growth and the future development strategy requires that we start to consider growth as well and so that is new pipes and roads potentially. Uh, yes, and thank you for reminding me about the fact that we did some time ago decide not to fully fund depreciation. I, I very much remember uh, saying that we would rue the day at the time, and in fact we are. Um, the uh, failure to uh, adequately fund uh, depreciation is uh, a very easy short piece of short-termism which uh, not only local but central government um, I think have indulged in and we do it at our peril. In terms of um, what we are going to absolutely have to do in the next year, uh, significant spends, um, Smooth Hill, are we fully budgeted for what we need to do for Smooth Hill? The draft budgets will include um, money for the development of the um, new landfill at Smooth Hill and Council will look at um, how that is phased and, and how they want to fund it. So is that largely unfunded at this stage? Are we looking at $50 million? What, what, what do you think is going to be needed next year for...? The level of detail about um, year on year, I'm sorry I don't have in front of me. Currently, um, the current LTP, and I, I will have to check this, but I think is $56 million currently in the 10-year plan for the development of Spoon Hill. I can't recall exactly which years it's in. That number um, won't be enough but and will need to be inflated and, and changed, and the timing will need to change depending on um, how long we're able to extend the life at Green Island for. Okay, that, that, that gives me a, a good feel, and thank you for that, uh, that. We've got 56 in the budget, but there could be a chunk chunk extra, but it sounded right. Um, now, Moana Pool, do we have a, a number that, that, I mean, it's obviously a bit of a problem. Do we have a number yet that might need to be spent there? As I said, the council are going to get their capital budgets for consideration in December, and there are a range of decisions around that and uh, Moana Pool and the maintenance of that will be one of them. Um, we had the Edgar Centre yesterday I think, uh, that, that there's consideration for that. There is um, Three Waters, unrestrained and restrained Three Waters, um, that will also depend on the legislative environment we find ourselves in and who is actually funding the water assets. Um, Councillor, I was just wondering that uh, we're we're here to focus on this paper because yes. you know you're talking about the the paper that's still yet to become you know still not finalised and is for the next council meeting. So I just you know we could spend a lot of time speculating on what might be in there and and being and being uh, posing questions that can't be fully answered. Uh, yes, my my apologies. I'm I'm basically just trying to get a handle on how we got here and. Uh, how that affects next year. We can't actually do much about what's already been spent, but we can do something about what's what's coming. Um, uh, I'll reserve any other questions I have for a bit later. Councillor Gary. Um, a question uh, for whomever would like to answer it. I understand, my understanding is the annual report is looking historically at what has happened, and that's what we're discussing now, is it not? Correct. Yeah, that's, what I've, that's the point I've just made. Uh, so, are there any further questions on this report? <laughs> Councillor Mark. It's on page 93, and I think, um, in fact, Mr Mayor raised it, uh, the increase in the amount of diversion of recyclable or reusable materials, and I note that it's gone up from 15% to 16%, which is an increase, although slight, but it does have beside it not achieved. Is that because um, in order to reach the target of 70% by 2030 that the actual, um, what's the word, um, the amount that it would have to increase each year is, um, is, is not able to hit that target? Because logic says it's increased, but um, is, it, is it put as not achieved because it hasn't increased enough to meet the target? You're correct. Ideally, the speed would be greater than just a 1% increase. So is this another, I'm not going to say ridiculous, me method, uh, measure? I mean, I know we're going to look at them in levels of service, but... 
It's hard. Um, I'm not across a level of detail with this one, I'm sorry, but I do know that um, if we are to achieve our waste minimisation targets as a city, then the, we need to be doing better than we are currently. And I think um, some of the things that we're about to roll out as a city will, will help that, and we'll, it's a good opportunity to look at if we have the levels of service right in this area. Councillor Vandervis. Just to respond uh, to Mr Mears uh, wanting to focus on, on the past 12 months, um, if I look at uh, the introduction from the Mayor, he says that significant capital projects have progressed well over the last 12 months with a capital spend of around 207 million. Then is mentioned the uh, George Street Retail Quarter and Mosgill's new Aquatic Centre. To sharpen my question, where does the rest of the 270 million sit? What capital projects have there been that aren't George Street and the Mosgill Pool? Um, so all of the capital expenditure is um, shown in section two. Um, so each it's shown separately for each group. Um, so for example, um, yeah. What page does it start at? So it follows. Um, so for example, page sixty, you'll see um, well that is parks and recreation. So twenty five point five million in total. So so we have a schedule. For of all of the capital projects um, by group within the document. To help people that, um, the general public that aren't really in a position to wade through all these papers, can you just give me a, a rough description of what these major capital projects are that are well over a hundred million dollars? I'll get you to the page. I'm just getting to the page in the report, Councillor, if you bear with. But it's so. So, what this is saying. So, for example, if you look at transport, my reading of that is that we did 32 and a bit million. Is that what it says? Oh, I was looking at this, but so 60 million in transport, so roads and footpaths. And that 60 million, that's capital spend or is it repairs and maintenance? It's capital. Sorry, 24 million renewals, 36 million of new capital, um, and 20 of that, of the new capital, is um, central city. 8 million is the peninsula. Right, we, okay, we've got 8 million peninsula. We already had the 34 for a central city. I'm still trying to find $100 million worth of capital projects that I seem to be unaware of. Right, so we, we will need to go through each group. So, um, Look, I don't, I don't want to take too much more time. Perhaps you could just send me a list later. Thank you. They are in the papers, and the capital program has been reported through the Finance Committee routinely, and so that, that's where it is. Does that cover it for you? There's a hundred million there. As 
uh, Councillor Barker said it's going to be really hard to add up, but I, I just look forward to, to getting a list. Um, my concern is that we are bunching a whole lot of stuff into supposed capital spend that is largely, in my view, just simply repairs and maintenance. Uh, I think, well, my reading of it through some of the earlier pages, they are divided into uh, capital spend and repairs and maintenance. Yeah, I, so, I, I've read that as well. That, you know, but it's, it's the division that I'm questioning. And really the question for the ratepayers of Dunedin is what brand new thing have we had for $207 million? Well, we've got George Street and we've got the Mosgill Pool and what else? Well, there's uh, 25 million of water and waste, which is probably invisible. So in terms of cattle spend. Okay. Sorry, um, sorry. I, I have... I, I, I just feel that I want to clarify because I think somehow there's a misunderstanding and I'm not sure if this will help. But the comment in the Mayor's opening statement that the capital spend of around $207 million is both new capital and renewals because they are, are both accounted for as capital. And so there's, there's not $207 million of bright new shiny things. Some of it is just fixing ageing infrastructure. But it's categorised as capital. And in terms of the hundred of core council capital commitments, there's 60 on roading. You know, as Councillor Wiley pointed out, page 164, 60 on roading, 25 on water and waste, and other property, plant, equipment, and intangibles, 15. So there's your 100 million, but of that, uh, 40 million of it is invisible, and it's under the roads or you know hidden behind walls. So it's not bright and shiny, but it is critically important for the functioning of the city. Uh, so. Uh, next question, Councillor Barker. I oh, just a, a question about audit when um, Councillor Vandivis brought up the capital. So we don't differentiate between new capital and renewals. We've got capital operational, and that's pretty much where the line is drawn. Is that correct? We do in the in the financial statements. Um, I think in the mayor's um, opening commentary, it's it's listed as a single figure, but the financial statements do make a distinction. In the, um, in the report, in the subcategories of various items, whether it's roading or wastewater, stormwater, freshwater, it, on each of those pages it does have capital expenditure and operational expenditure. It does split them out. Anyway, I think that might cover, cover the questions. I think we've exhausted questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, that being the case, um, thank you very much Mr Allen for your attendance and joining us today. Can you hear me okay? I can, thank you Mayor. Um, can, can I sign off now or do you want yes. me to wait while uh, the motion is brought to Council? No, I think, I think You've covered it because you've answered, you know, all the questions required of you. Thank you very much, and uh, covered there off some go. detail for us. So that's really good. We appreciate. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillors. We appreciate Thank your you, attendance. Mayor. Thank you. Bye bye. Always, always my pleasure. So, uh, I'm prepared to move the motion, which will uh, come up on the screen behind you, that we approve the report and delegate Chief Executive to make minor editorial changes, of which there may be others required. And um, we'll go ahead and sign that off. And we've obviously received the audit report. And here we are in time for the uh, end of October. So uh, do I have a seconder for that, Deputy Mayor Lucas? So um, in bringing this and speaking to this, we have a range of, um, well, it's quite a substantial budget. And we have a range of uh, areas where there, there is, you know, we would like things to be better, but we have faced very challenging times over the last few years. Lest we forget, uh, we've had three years of COVID, 
and that during that time interest rates have risen steadily and all in, uh, inflation has similarly increased and most of our expenses have gone up and in particular for a procurement uh, and in the area of uh, logistics. So it's a very challenging time and it's not just us, it is the whole country. It is all councils throughout the country and it is the government as a whole. And it's not just New Zealand, it's right around the world. So everybody is facing a much uh, increased costs and higher costs of living. So we are well aware of the pressure on our ratepayers and residents and obviously we'll be mindful of that when it comes to the, the next long-term plan. But I think we made uh, good decisions with this uh, that are shown in this annual report and you know we had to be prepared either way for the outcome of the election and what would happen with Three Waters. Um, we have moved to improve our water supply and our wastewater treatment and our stormwater uh, carrying ability and so thus improving our the quality of our supply and our resilience you know into the future and I think that's very important in the circumstance and I think sitting around and waiting for someone else to fix the problem for us is typically um, a very unreliable way of um, getting to where anyone needs to go, let alone a city of this size. So I think um, taking our future in our hands and doing the work and making things happen so that we are better prepared uh, to meet the regulations that we all knew were coming and um, whilst they, uh, as we've seen in the earlier report uh, or the earlier submission to the ORC, the regulator, we have Tamara Arawai and then our local regulator all imposing stricter and tighter conditions upon us, uh, necessitating uh, in the future greater expense. So it will be an ongoing debate as to where that uh, money is sourced and where it comes from, and all communities throughout New Zealand will face the same dilemma, and I'm sure central government uh, will have a lot to say on the matter as we go forward, as will our ratepayers and residents. So uh, in the meantime, uh, I think you know we've done well to advance the city as we have, and I think all of the uh, people around this table have uh, worked hard to make it happen, uh, and also our predecessors that um, worked hard to get a whole lot of things done in the city, and it will be an ongoing thing. Uh, everyone wants to improve, uh, and everyone wants. Um, not to incur the cost. So we always have to balance that up as we go forward. Who else would like to comment? Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I um, love a good colour-coded spreadsheet, so I always um, spreadsheet the achievements of the um, annual reports because I like a good trend analysis as well. Um, with the annual report, I was it was just in time and it was a, a long and hard read and, and there wasn't really enough time to digest it and I think that was reflected in the, the number of questions. Um, the key thing that we're actually delivering on is the promises that we've made our community um, and the levels of service we agree with our community uh, a long time ago through our 10-year plan and our annual plans and as I have pointed out there are some real issues with achieved or, or not achieved. Um, first, the good news, the levels of service were up in water from 44% to 60%. So that's um, across all of the measures, which is actually a huge increase, which is great. Sewerage up 33% to 50% of the measures achieved. Libraries and museums up 45% to 55%. Um, social wellbeing, the sense of community was up 55 to 59 per cent um, and our infrastructure satisfaction overall was up um, 54 per cent to 63 per cent. So when we're looking at what we're investing in capital we are actually um, getting some good results there. And I did ask a question about cycling earlier because it looked like the cycle counts had gone down but actually people jogging, cycling, public transport to work had gone up 4 per cent from 17 per cent to 21 per cent. So I think that's important when we look at the um, investments that we're making into public, well trying to make public transport easier um, as well. We have also gone up on agreeing that Dunedin is a sustainable city from 39% to 
43%. Um, and Dunedin is a leader in sustainable city development. Still kind of low, but it's up 3%. Um, not so great is the fall in the roading and footpath measures, stormwater satisfaction, which is often a bit of a mystery because it's something that we actually can't see, so it's very difficult um, to see that one. And, and property was down a little bit, but that related to um, to project delays. And my key concern is the overall uh, achievement of the um, measures had, had fallen from 41.5% overall to 34.5%, and that's why I was digging down into the levels of service, and we missed a lot of them by 1%. 1% margin of error is 2.6% in the rod, and that's why I was really concerned about those, um, and asked especially a, a, as well about the um, the increase in the waste, because how do you measure achieved or not achieved, and that sort of comes back to that auditing as well. Um, that's why the reason why I asked. Um, so we need to focus very carefully on our measures, and I know we're doing some work streams about that, but then we have to really focus on those levels of service when we're going through this and, and what the um, the community wants. I also, um, and I think Councillor Vandervis will want this as well, is listing the achievements at the start of the report because there's a few paragraphs in there now, but I feel like, you know, 200 pages. <laughs> we just really want to read the summary. What did ratepayers get for their money? They want to understand what were our achievements um, and also where did we spend that money and it is quite hard to to go through and, and, and find all of those things. And this is a really, really important document because this is about, this is our school report, this is what we have achieved um, for the year and buried in it are some um, really great achievements and we look at the, the <coughs> practical things that we've done to make Dunedin a better city to live. We've had 1.6 kilometres of stormwater pipe renewal, so that's the stuff that they can't see and they're less, less satisfied with but actually we've done a whole lot of work. Um, 3.5 kilometres network of water mains replaced, um, our speed management plan I'm aware of time. Centre city upgrade, peninsula connection, um, how many playgrounds? Oh, six playground upgrades, pay by plate, parking meters upgraded, the Mosgill pool opened, our volunteer hours were increased by 85%, the railway station upgrade, the new electric book bus, business clinics increased. Um, so we had a whole lot of actual great things that were happening in the report, but it was actually a little bit difficult to see those things about all of the, the money that we're investing in. And because I've just got a few seconds left, I want to say that this is the last day for the pre-engagement as well. So if everyone wants to get on their social media and get out there and tell um, the community to tell us what they want and what levels of service they want um, for our next long-term plan and our next annual plan. So that was the ad. Thank you. Can I just add in that I forgot to say thank you to the staff. That is the key thing. Um, thank you to all the council staff for their work delivering the better city for us all. And I know it's been really tough. We look at these results and we've still got there. So the Mayor mentioned that COVID hangover. Thank you. Councillor Vandervis. Yeah, I'd like to echo that the uh, staff are to be congratulated, uh, particularly with uh, wrangling with the auditors to get a sign off on time. Um, well done all. Um, and also, I think uh, staff really congratulated for um, an annual report in which the financial data is accurate. Um, it's all in there somewhere. It's not as accessible as we'd like, um, but there don't seem to have been any uh, particular emissions or problems that have been identified. So um, those are the pluses. Um, there are some severe worries for me, however, with the DCC annual report. Um, the primary one being that, again, we have for the second time now an unbalanced budget, this time only 89% of what was uh, uh, planned. Um, an unbalanced budget is a, is a really ugly thing in, in my view, um, something to be avoided at all costs, if I can use the phrase, um, because the costs of an unbalanced budget are something that you bear in the next year and years following. And in an environment um, where we have the next major problem, and that is that um, we have an interest cost now, which I believe is unsustainable. Um, and that interest cost, although it was hoped earlier this year that it might come down after the election, um, uh, all the overseas um, uh, pundits that I've uh, looked at, generally speaking, don't believe that's going to happen any time soon, probably not for several years. I think we simply have to accept a severe negative in the interest rate um, cost 
to this council because we have such a massive debt. Um, it was also uh, uh, a bit disappointing that the audit is again qualified, although um, answers from the chief executive indicate that the qualifications uh, have not been uh, really uh, that major and that they will be sorted for next year round. Um, the last real issue, and I think we're going to get into that in more detail shortly, is that uh, the um, uh, dividend return uh, from our companies is again not able to deliver anything like a commercial return on the investment that we have in our companies. And this is also something which I think is going to severely restrict what we're able to do in the future unless we can get that return up to a commercial level. Um, but I hope to address that in more detail uh, when we come to the annual reports for DCHL. Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, the detail of the uh, annual report has been well canvassed, so I'm not going to add anything to that. Um, I did want to add my voice to the achievement of making the deadline, and as we heard from Mr Allen, uh, that was quite some achievement, uh, and congratulate Ms Allen, as this is the first one that you have um, fronted for us and the team. Um, the other points I wanted to make were around um, the increase in audit fee, uh, and that we have no choice. We have no choice in terms of who does the audit, and those increased fees continue to climb extraordinarily. Um, and as I voiced in my questions, uh, my at the ones which in some regard I believe are quite pedantic uh, and they seem to get more so as the years go by. I'm not at all concerned about those qualifications um, and we know that some of those will fall off but I'm sure that they will, I have a, a confident feeling that they will find more. And yes they have a job to do but it just does seem to be a trajectory that uh, I find a level of frustration with. Um, and finally around future reporting, when we come to the companies there's some uh, wonderfully accessible, I would frame it as, um, annual reports and I, I'm delighted to hear um, the thought uh, and the intention from the Chief, and thank you Chief, around um, how we might explore and deliver a document that is more accessible to our community. It is, after all, a particularly important document right up there with the long-term plan, uh, and it is something that we should be celebrating our achievements in and identifying where the issues lie. Um, so I look forward to that process. Councillor uh, Fiso. Mr Mayor, um, I'd just like to add to the thanks and congratulations to um, to the staff, uh, CEO Graham and all her staff, uh, particularly Ms Allen, um, as Councillor Gary said, uh, it's her first uh, annual report, so congratulations and thank you so much. Uh, for um, making us uh, look good at, in time. Um, and I just, um, in case you think that I despise all pale and male um, people, I just want to acknowledge, for me, um, Gordon Campbell, who has been writing uh, for the last few months on the recession engineered by the Reserve Bank. And I just want to quote from his article in June, um, and I'm talking about the um, the so-called living costs crisis. So he says um, from he quotes from Moody Analytics and says in particular expenditure on services was up by 2.3 percent amid a rise in international air passenger services. In other words, Kiwis are spending less on non-durables as they hunker down, but are still wanting to travel internationally as the long and isolating COVID-related restrictions of prior years remain banked in memories across the country. In other words, poor and middle income workers are being punished by the Reserve Bank via interest rate hikes meant to dampen down inflationary fires that A, they did not create, and B, which are now being perpetuated, perpetuated by profit taking and spending on services by a relatively wealthy class of people, us. So, 
and then I would just acknowledge um, Mick Lynch, who's the General, Secret General Secretary in Britain, the, um, the railway workers. Uh, I recommend for some entertaining, perhaps, viewing how he actually deals with um, politicians at central government and, and, and their ignorance and just exposing um, their ignorance of how real people live. And then finally, uh, Professor Mark Blythe. He's been doing lots of work on the um, stupidity, that's my term, uh, of austerity as an approach. And he just acknowledges that he um, is a beneficiary of the welfare state in uh, Scotland or in, you know the UK. Uh, he works as a professor of uh, economics and, and political science in America, but he's done a lot of work to say he was a beneficiary of the uh, welfare state in terms of getting an education, and now look what we've been doing to the children worldwide student loans. Thank you to the staff. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I have to um, agree with many um, to thank CEO Graham, her team and staff across the organisation. Um, I actually found this, I, get, I don't know whether, what category this puts me in, I found it quite a fascinating read. Um, it's amazing what you dig down and find out of uh, this report. You know, who I, I didn't wasn't sure about it, but I remember when we started this, who knew that 16,000 pavers in total were shared with 14 different groups around the community? But it was great to see the team from Isaacs also went out and helped uh, put lay some of those pavers with those organisations. 10,000 seedlings were planted reserves around the city by volunteers. You know, there's a, there's a lot of good reading and, the, and the, the pundits that want to throw stones and rocks and anything else at council may want to take time to actually have a look at this report and, and see what is actually happening across council. You know, there's measurements around the traffic times, whether it's coming from Mosgill, Sinclair, Normanby, into town by car and by bus and by bike. And there's, so it gives you a really good snapshot of what's going on around the city. And I think that's the important part, that this actually has a lot of fascinating data when you want to see the picture of the city and where we're going. This report is a report in past. It is through to June 30th, 2023. It's talking about what has happened. And the numbers actually do tell quite a story in that sense. It shows that there has been a lot of activity. Yes, there's been a lot of spend, but we've got a lot from it. And I think that's the important part, is that for anybody wanting to look at council, look at what's going on. Are we delivering for the city? And after reading this annual report, I actually see the city is humming along quite nicely. There's a lot of positives to be taken from it. Yes, there's a lot of headwinds and challenges in front of us. But every city, every country has that at the moment. The key thing is we're setting ourselves up, as I see it from this report, to actually navigate that better than most. And we've got a good team to do that with. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for a, a, a more um, accessible annual plan, not only just for the public, actually, but for I'm selfish, for me personally. And C Councillor Wiley, I can recommend some good bedtime reading for, for you, actually. It's, um, I've tried it twice, never got through it. It's the trial by Franz Kafka, if, you're, if you really want to get your head into something um, difficult. Um, also, I think it's, I mean, everyone else has done it, but I'll do it anyway. And um, thanks to for, for, for the tremendous Mahi from our staff, um, Miss Allen, um, team et al, and, and Miss Graham. Um, this is excellent work that is not in any way easy um, um, and is always going to be received with, um, with um, a level of intrigue, scepticism, and questioning, but well, well, well done. Um, I'm reading this, and I alluded to, to it earlier, particularly in the context of being um, uh, a member of the Levels of Service 10-year plan working group. 
um, I will get my, my, my tongue around that name eventually, that it's, that it's never been a, a better time actually for us to, to be, to be um, reviewing our, our levels of service. Uh, actually, they need to be, and they will be cleaner, more definitive, and most importantly, fairer. So, as, and we'll be seeing that, that, that work come in front of us soon, which I think will feed into us getting a better AP um, ultimately. And I guess just touching on what Councillor Wiley said, I think it's um, it's easy to get hung up in the numbers, which are important, without remembering the plethora of good work that we've all voted here to do and previously to do, and it goes back often to many previous councils, and not forgetting also that a large amount of the work that I think we've decided to do is is invisible because it's it's the it's that unsexy unseeable stuff under the ground and whether we like and we should be proud of it and whether we like it or not um, it's important to remember if you defer and don't do that work that is a good way of getting community interested in councils because when that stuff fails they're going to be banging down our doors to ask why we didn't take the brave decision to make those investments. Thank you. Thank you. No more speakers? Here we go. So uh, I think everything needs to be said about this has been said because I think um, uh, it is a substantive report and it is history, it is what happened. And I think we can all see elements of what we want in there, and we can all see elements of things that we would prefer not to have. So, you know, there's, there's good and bad, and there's expensive and, and entirely reasonable things. But at the front of this report is the list, um, you know, of our current uh, strategic framework and the various outcomes that we're working on for our community. So our community can see that we are working to deliver a, a city for them that they want to do, that they want to live in, and so we are engaging now, uh, uh, which ends today, as pointed out, the, the pre-engagement for the next long-term plan, and so we are being actively getting out there with and amongst the community to get them thinking about, talking about, and participating in the long-term plan, and we've put up mechanisms to make that easier uh, for them to do so. So uh, my expectation is that they uh, will appreciate that and they certainly have been participating and I think that bodes well for our ongoing uh, interaction with the community. Having said that, we see the resolution on the um, wall behind me that we approve the annual report, delegate uh, the authority to make any minor amendments as required and um, authorise sign off and the letter of representation to the author, the auditor on behalf of the council. And uh, we've already received his audit report, so we're happy with that, and uh, adopt the audited annual report for the year ending. So, uh, I don't, I didn't actually detect any uh, dissension in the overall plan, so I'll put it by, to the vote. Do all those in favour say aye. A division is called for. Councillor Acklin. Aye. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. Aye. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried unanimously. Thank you. And can it, we have a five minute recess for a comfort stop? Seconded Councillor Walker. All those in favour say aye. aye. Another unanimous resolution.
which will have a positive impact on our borrowing costs. Um, and we also joined the LGFA Climate Action Loan Program um, on the back of DCC's reduction targets, again um, reducing the cost of funding to the group. We continue to coordinate cross-group work on wellbeing initiatives across the companies and on cyber security across the, across the group. Um, and finally, the Graham Crombie Intern Director Program continues to um, operate uh, with a new intake um, scheduled for early in the new year. So and it's, a, it's in its third iteration. Um, and we believe it's starting to uh, deliver um, some upskilling, particularly in the Dunedin community. Um, just to acknowledge um, Gemma and Hannah, our, our very small team that um, achieved the delivery of our accounts within the regulatory time, time frame, um, albeit their time frame um, ended up some three to four o'clock in the mornings to get there at the end of September. So uh, just to echo the thanks to them, they had the equal challenges which it sounds DCC had. Um, and finally, and remiss of me, um, Peter Hocking to my, to my left is the new GM of uh, DCHL. Uh, he took over on the first week in October um, after Gemma completed uh, a sort of a longer exit plan as she handled the uh, end of year accounts. So um, Peter wasn't here for them. Um, Gemma did that before she uh, departed. Um, that's my comments. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm sure we'll have some questions from councillors. Councillor Vandivis. Thank you for um, the introduction and for this massive paperwork. Um, in the Chair's review on page seven, um, the, it says that the group as a whole recorded a profit of 3.3 million. Um, and this consolidated result is a product not only of the company's individual profits and losses, but also the accounting eliminations of dividend flows. There's the suggestion here that the forecasts uh, do not include intercompany transaction eliminations. Uh, so that instead of the 9 million that uh, was budgeted, we ended up with 3.3 million. Is what you're saying here that it's because of eliminations uh, accounting um, that we've gone from 9 million down to 3.3 million? Um, I'm not the accountant in the room, but I'll try to um, explain it to you in a layman's terms. The individual company's profits are correct, and if I go specifically to Aurora, it made what it declared. Um, equally, Delta made what it declared. Under the accounting rules, um, you have to eliminate um, eliminate the intercompany transactions when the parties are dealing with each other. So in the case of Aurora, it has work in progress um, performed by Delta, um, and that will obviously and that's the, the capital program at the point of balance date. Equally, Delta has uh, work in progress. Which it hasn't, which it has a margin on, which it charges Aurora. So accounting standards mean that those activities at the balance date have to be eliminated. So otherwise, you would be counting this, the capital investment and the capital um, cost twice if they weren't eliminated. So individual companies are correct. It's just when it hits DCHL at a consolidation level, the auditor or the accounting standards means they have to be eliminated. So the poor result from 9.3 million down to 3.3 million, is that a result of eliminations or have eliminations been taken into account before that? So I should have explained that. Within the SOI process, we haven't budgeted for eliminations because they could be in theory nil one year if there was no work in progress at balance date, or they could be materially more depending on the volume of a volume of work at the point in, at each balance date. We're looking, based on the fact we've had this issue now for three years, we're now looking to take an average view across those three years and incorporate that into the SOI process so we have a, a, a more accurate like-for-like -like program um, forecast than what we currently do of not allowing for it in the SOI at all. 
So you started out by saying that companies are in good shape, but we have just 3.3 million net profit. What, what's the reason for this poor result? My comment about the companies being in good shape was uh, on the back of the audit. So um, audits can always find things. That's the purpose of them. And we got a, a what I'd say is a, a pretty good audit outcome. Um, performance is a different comment. Um, if we step through the companies, the airport's going pretty well. Um, DVML, um, DSPL, for what it's uh, worth, and it doesn't actually generate dividends. Um, those two companies won't be paying us a dividend. It's, it's not envisioned that they will do because they create e economic benefit for the city. Delta's had its challenges, albeit it did pay a million dollar dividend. Um, and Aurora um, has become profitable, but given its challenges over the last five years, they're trying to get their balance sheet back into a reasonable form before they resume paying dividends. So you'll see the, the profits there. Um, it's just picking the time when they should um, start paying or can afford to pay dividends. And City Forests uh, are in a similar position with commodity markets as they are. Um, they're not generating the same level of cash as what they've done in previous years. So, And on top of that, um, we're also charged with funding to Needham Railways and of course we also absorb the seven million odd dollar cost of owning um, the stadium as well. So there's a gap between what we commercially get and then what other things we absorb on behalf of the city. Right, yep, uh, I get that and thank you for that full explanation. You mentioned the joining the LGFA and, and how it's reduced your interest, interest cost. In the time that you've been with the LGFA, can you quantify roughly how much of an advantage it's been given that we also incur liabilities with LGFA? It's got a benefit. Um, it's probably circa two to three basis points. I think before we went into it, um, there was a review undertaken, and de depending on how much funding we ultimately put with LGFA, it, I think it was circa two to three hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, but that's subject to um, the quantum that we actually do borrow ultimately from LGFA. At present, we've got a relatively small amount from them. Thank you very much. Um, you'll be getting more from them, given the two to three basis points advantage, or? The bottom line is, for, for the mid to longer term funding, they are cheaper. So yes, that's, yes we would. Um, in the shorter term, well, there's other beneficial products that we would use, which is cheaper than, or they don't actually offer those short term funding options. Thank you. Um, I'll have some more questions later, if that's okay. Certainly. Um, I've got a couple of little questions. So I'm looking at the consolidated net profit um, table in the annual report. And I'm just curious, you know, you've talked about the eliminations and it, they are included, they, there were eliminations in 2022 and I imagine there'd be eliminations in each of the previous years as well. However, when you go to the statement of intent uh, forecast, you don't have a figure in the projection for this, the 23 year for eliminations. So in other words, you haven't included eliminations in the budget or the you know, statement of intent forecast, but it seems to me that inevitably there will be and there were you know, 2.8 uh, million of eliminations. So my question is, why don't you put a um, projection for eliminations in that statement of intent, because you know, I mean, ostensibly, we might have expectations of a nine million dollar uh, profit, uh, but it comes in at three, but uh, three and a half or three million, but in fact, three million of that nine is eliminations and round figures. So we can't project the eliminations. Um, all at best, we we can do is. Um, make an allowance for what they may possibly be because they will vary from one year to the other depending on what the work in progress is at balance date and that, and that can fluctuate. So our board is currently looking at um, adopting 
the position of taking the average, given we've got had three years of these now, um, taking the average of the three years and putting it in as a placeholder just so we're not ignoring something that we know is going to happen, albeit we don't know the quantum of it. So it's not a forecast, it's a placeholder, um, so it's not ignored. Right. Okay, so um, that aside, uh, it looks to me that so it would be a fair projection to say that the expected rate of return would be six million, and the reason why we didn't achieve that and only achieved three was um, essentially a COVID effect because the need in Stadium properties limited was it well used compared to previous years? Hence, well, you know, c compared to <laughs> pre 2020, uh, and so that's really where the um, shortfall is compared to projections. In my uh, view of it, is that accurate or not? There's also the factor of um, interest costs has increased as well, so there's a whole lot of pluses and minuses in there. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's partially that, but there's, a, there's an awful lot of moving parts across those groups, oh, yeah. entities. But generally the, the, the companies are doing okay. Yes, but I'm some sympathy with Councillor Vanders' view is that we're not delivering adequate, adequate return to the um, to the ultimate shareholder, and that can partially be put down to what the asset classes we have are they intergenerational? I'd say so. They are intergenerational assets, um, which is somewhat different to assets that generate um, short-term annual annual cash flows to the to the shareholder. So that's a bigger question for for another day. Yes, thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I note in the Delta report that they um, got a distribution from the, the Outhurst investment of $3 million. Is that the final expected um, distribution to come from the Outhurst? Yes, it is. <coughs> and without that distribution, then the company would have made a loss of approximately half a million dollars. So I guess that that's a concerning... I mean, I know the COVID effect, and I mean, I've read the report... Um, and is there um, mechanisms in place that, or do you believe, you know, we're a quarter and that we'll see improvement this year? Um, so we've been signalling that for the last 12 to 18 months that um, operationally um, they are, have been challenged. Um, and yes, you're right, they do have the offset of the Yieldhurst funds in the, in the past years. So in the first quarter in, um, they are tracking um, ahead of last year operationally and they are profitable um, however they're still not quite reaching their budgeted positions so it's still very much a work in progress and a watch albeit that um, they do have some renewals happening which take effect in Jul uh, June, April, sorry, April next year um, which will significantly underpin their future outcomes. Thank you. Um I see in the holding company report that you've got, um, for the first time, you've got the gender pay gap um, bench, which I think you should be congratulated on. It's very good to see that, and I'm sure that you'll be working on reducing that gap. I think it's 10% at the moment. Um, and are you going to look in the future? You mentioned it about ethnic reporting as well. Um, it was sort of taking things slowly and, and learning as we went, so the gender pay gap was the first stage. Um, we are slightly challenged given the type of businesses we own to solve that gap, just availability um, of people to, to fill those roles, but it's certainly something the company's focused on. Um, the ethnic piece is um, for the future. Um, it was a matter of how we could gather the data accurately um, and get permissions to gather the data. So yeah, it's, it's on the radar. Uh, thank you. Um, in DVE mail, um, I note that they've made some improvement on their waste reduction strategy in moving um, away from single-use plastic cups to cans, um, and I'm probably stealing Councillor Gilbert's thunder on his favourite subject um, in terms of single-use coffee cups and other single-use um, products that I know, I mean, waste is a big issue if, you know, having been there at the end of a concert and seeing the significant level of waste. Um, are they, you know, looking at, at improving that, that waste reduction? Um, cans is the, the current solution. Um, as much as the cups or the single-use cups that they buy, or the plastic ones, um, have recyclable on them, um, there's no one to recycle them. So that's that's a challenge. So 
cat that they're continually focused on this and they are looking at what's happening around the world in terms of solutions because it is a it's a global thing in the stadiums so they're not sitting there uh, or waiting for something they are actively looking excellent thank you and i'm i'm presuming um, it's um, commercial sensitivity that in terms of their um, in their um, statement of service performance where they talk about retention rates for membership and um, sponsorship where it just says achieved and it doesn't specify the detail that's obviously um, in relation to commercial sensitivity. That's correct. Thank you. And my final question, if I may, in relation to City Forest, and I, um, I know it's looking at the future where they talk about in the outlook that they're looking at a special dividend coming from carbon credits of $13.5 million for the current year. Um, and based on the current pricing of those carbon credits, which obviously has had an impact on their balance sheet this year because it's significantly down on where it was the year before, um, is that a prudent um, outlook to be looking at a special dividend by selling carbon credits based on what the current price is? I know it's crystal ball gazing of where that price may land going forward. From memory, the market recovered two weeks after balance date to the previous level. So um, yes, it's prudent. It's really the source of the cash flow to pay it. Um, but equally, it's the capital structure um, I think they've got an equity position around 75%, so they're, all, they're in that lazy balance sheet category. So there's two levels to it. One is um, redistributing that overcapitalisation, but B, how they fund it, and the mechanism to fund it is by selling carbon credits. That's also part of the longer-term strategy to um, risk manage the, the exposure to the carbon credits, um, and that's around selling down give or take or subject to market conditions around 10% per year. So rather than being a long-term speculator in carbon credits, it's a matter of releasing them um, on a prudent basis, um, given that most forecasts say that the value of them will continue to increase. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, and, th and thanks for this extensive bunch of reading. Um, just two questions initially, just in terms of, and it doesn't matter if you're A2 Milk, Silver Fern Farms, or Sinley Milk, there's obvious um, trade headwinds in China. So in terms of um, City Forest, and I think we've touched on this previously, um, in terms of the potential to look for, for, for longer term sustainable diversification of, of trading markets, where is that still something that's front and center of the board's thinking? Um, the City Forest, they're obviously looking to optimise or maximise the returns for their for their products. Um, the reality is Korea and China are their core markets for their products, which gives the effective return. Um, they do diversify as much as it's prudent onto the domestic market, um, but right now, on the, the, whilst they still look, um, the, those three markets are their key markets. So the answer to the question is no? Um, the answer to the question is yes, they're looking, but they haven't found anything. And secondly, um, there's been, and there will continue to be lots of talk around the table about us um, being in a high interest environment, but considering the rolling average of interest rates between 85 and this year to 2023, 20, 20, I think it's 6.72%, rather than a high interest environment, is it you're feeling um, that basically, we're basically back into a normal cycle of, I'd say, correct. It's, it'd be more of a correction. We're now in a correct interest environment if you look at the average historically. Um, I'm not the economicist, economist either. Um, th these things go in cycles, and this is cycle, um, to be fair, was, wasn't unexpected. Our challenge at DCTL is to not get caught as we had done eight years earlier um, with long-term debt at relatively high rates which um, came down from circa eight percent down to um, less than one percent over that period so we're cautiously um, following or, or uh, working with various advisors so we don't get caught with um, a book um, that misses the inevitable downward trend in interest rates so it's a fine line so how do you Absolutely. Very good. 
Councillor Barker. Yes. Uh, just one in regard to the airport and waste reduction strategy. And I know that we went through the process with um, the uh, letters of expectation and the statement of intent, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, about waste reduction. And it says in here the waste reduction strategy was implemented, however, no specific diversion from landfill targets was set, which seems to be. I guess quite an oversight, uh, but when I go out to the airport as I was on the weekend, um, there's some large, um, what are those things that you put the money in and you get the um, dispenser machines, still selling water in plastic bottles and plastic um, chips and all that kind of stuff. Can we expect that that will be addressed? It's a really I think bad visual statement for people to be going out there and seeing that with the waste minimisation. I know this is just a minor thing, but it's kind of one of those PR things that's kind of important. Um, opportunity we have at the um, AGM um, with our partners there on Monday, so it's something we'll raise. Uh, and I'll, 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 let me ask the question. Yep. I, I know it's a tiny operational thing, but it's that perception issue. I know offshore they have water stations now and people all carry bottles and you refill the water. So probably a, there's probably a simple solution. I'd be surprised they don't have it on their radar. Okay. Are there any, any further questions? There appear. Councillor Vandervis. City forests. Um, we've seen some worrying... Um, headlines recently about uh, ongoing uh, issues if they'd have a 50 metre setback um, and obviously that is not something that uh, appears here but um, uh, city forests have already been under some pressure as, as you stated earlier. Um, borrowings that they have done um, can you confirm what city forests have borrowed in quantum and how that was distributed, and whether any of it was distributed as a subvention to Aurora. It, there was no subventions to Aurora. Um, any subventions that are available have been used against Dunedin DSPL. And the amount of borrowing that um, City Forest did, I see that they've sold uh, 11 million dollars worth of carbon credits. Um, what I'm, I'm having trouble finding their um, their borrowing and and what they did with that. Um, it would be going into their total debt position, but in principle, the purpose of them selling those carbon credits is to fund um, the re recapitalisation structure um, that we put in place which has seen us um, increase their special dividend to DCHL which in turn has been passed on to DCC. Thank you. Sorry, one last question. Um, there's a line here that says intra-group tax loss subvention receipt of two million eight hundred and seventy nine dollars um, cash flows from operating activities um, is this not a subsidy from Aurora page 208 I'll try and find it again here Yeah, near the top of page 208, um, Statement of Cash Flows, Intergroup Tax Loss Subvention Receipt. Um, uh, uh, last year it was 3.8 million, this year it's 2.879. Is that not a subvention payment to them and does that flow through to their profit? Sorry, you've got us into the bowels of technical accounting stuff. Can we come back to, with an answer on that? We're, we're that appears to be it for questions.
So thank you very much, gentlemen. And so uh, at this point, I'll move that Council notes uh, the annual reports of the uh, Council Control Companies. I have a second for that, Councillor Walker. So who would like to speak to that? Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Of course, I did the statistics on this to see um, how well they performed. Last year, they um, got 90% of their targets overall, and this year it's gone up to 92%. And I guess that is an amazing achievement. Um, and, and, and thank you to the nearly 900 people that work at um, the employees, plus all of the directors that, um, that try to do their best with our, our council investments. I guess I just wanted to point out the performance targets, because the reason that I asked yesterday, it seems a long time ago, about the forward work program and the letters of expectations is that we absolutely need to be very targeted in what we're asking for from our companies because while it's a, um, a wonderful achievement to get 92% of the performance targets, it is um, also are we, are we having stretch targets there and are we looking at the right things and I guess I dug right down into the weeds with um, my question about the waste minimisation because I look at what we've done with our statements of intent going forward and we will lose any um, clarity that we have over some of the things that we as, as our council policies really care about. Uh, is this going to open and it's going to crash? Um, given that we've got $1.83 billion worth of assets in our companies, we absolutely need to keep a very, very sharp eye on them and make sure that they are performing. And I think Councillor Vandervist asked a lot of financial questions about um, how we are getting delivery on those investments for our city. And I also think that we really do need to be looking at um, what's coming out. And I do believe that we, with the investment plan, we will certainly be looking at what our community assets and what are the... Um, producing assets, so I look forward to um, further fantastic performances from the um, Dunedin City Holdings, Holdings and all of their, their companies, um, including some nice large dividends for all the things that we need to pay for soon. Thank you. Councillor Vandervis. Unlike Councillor Barker, I don't take any comfort at all in 90 to 92 per cent of performance targets because those targets themselves, quite frankly, were, in my view, uh, pitiful in terms of a uh, profit return. I fully accept that um, uh, DCHL have quite a problem and that they've been essentially lumbered with a number of companies that were never intended to be profitable, and I'm talking about Dunedin Rail, the stadium, etc. Um, but uh, DCHL have three companies which are fundamentally commercial. They are Aurora, by far the biggest, Delta and City Forests, and they should all be making a healthy commercial return of somewhere near the region of 5%. We're not getting a fraction of that. We haven't had a fraction of that since 2015. And the reasons um, for that seem to be the same and roll over pretty much every year. Um, it's good that the companies are in good shape in terms of their audit processes. Um, uh, but um, their audit processes uh, deliver no dividends. The reason for having Aurora, Delta and City Forests are to deliver dividends, and that reason um, basically hasn't been there. It's encouraging that um, there are small savings now with our interest costs, because interest costs are uh, a major um, stumbling block to supplying dividends. But as Mr Cooper has confirmed, there are only uh, 200 to 300,000 uh, currently, a um, uh, few basis points. And um, we can't hope for significant easing of interest costs for DCC or DCHL in the coming year or two, in my view. So um, what we really need to do, I believe, is we need to um, compartmentalise those city forest, uh, those um, DCHL businesses that should be giving us a commercial return, Aurora, Delta and city forests, and we should be looking to get a 5% uh, commercial return on the investment out of them. 
there was one page I noted in here where it claimed that there was 9.5% um, return on the shareholder advance. That's not the uh, aim again. It shouldn't be a performance target. What should be a performance target is proper commercial return on the proper commercial uh, that we have. And if we need to restructure or we need to do something significantly different to get that, then I think as a council we need to look very hard at changing things so that we can get a commercial return. It's simply not good enough year on year to let these companies bumble along um, without giving any significant dividends. Now I note that we have got a, an increase um, for the first time this year as well as the uh, return on um, the uh, interest that uh, we've provided them which has usually been about 5 million, I think 5.9 million this year. We have got a 5.5 million um, uh, dividend which is a start. <coughs> Um, but it's a, a fairly small start and if you consider uh, that some of the companies have actually increased borrowings um, it would appear to me at least um, to actually provide this um, slide. So um, I welcome the report in terms of its completeness. I'd love to see some more digestible summaries of Delta and City Forests and um, hope that um, we can do much better next year. You're looking at me, I didn't have my hand up but I'll, I'll speak anyway. Um, and uh, Councillor Van Der has motivated me yet again to speak but it's actually in a positive vein this time because I don't disagree with um, some of what he said actually. Um, particularly around the compartmentalisation of some of our some of our companies, there I don't think it would be the most illogical move we could make as a council. Actually, because some of those um, <clears throat> other businesses are, I see them there potentially as uh, as a community good, and I don't think they should be. Um, uh, um, I guess in the mix with what should be I, higher dividend paying. Uh, companies, and I think there's there's a great outlook in the future actually for Aurora, and I think we should applaud the work that that board has done and continues to do, um, and I think we will be looking back in 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 in, in the future uh, at the dark times and celebrating some of the better times. I mean, City Forest, of course, is is a, is a potential um, large money maker. Um, hence my question around diversification, and I would urge the board, although I won't, I, I, I don't sit on the board, but I think it would be imprudent of any board that trades said commodity not to try and look to future-proof that business by diversification, wherever that may, that may, may be. Um, Delta, again, uh, it has its issues, continues to have some issues, I believe, um, structurally, but I think um, let's fingers fingers crossed that's that's going to pull pull itself um, out, out of darker times and into the light. And it would also include um, Dial in there as well. But um, some of those other businesses, the rail, um, the stadium, um, I see more as a community good um, um, set of organisations. So. Um, there we go on that. And just going uh, going previously back to a couple of questions around, I think um, Councillor Lucas and Barker alluded to some of the, our environmental um, obligations. It ain't going to change the world by getting rid of plastic bottles or or, um, or throwaway coffee cups, but I think it's <coughs> optically, I think it sits well for us. I think it's um, it's a double it's a double standard to say we have um, a zero waste and uh, a zero carbon 2030 goal without actually doing the easy low fruit stuff first. I've travelled extensively uh, around the world, and I did. I came back recently, as you all know, and pretty much every airport I went through in Asia and Europe. There was, it was a pleasure to see a lack of disposable coffee cups, a lack of plastic bottles, and there were water filling stations all over the world. Um, I know there's a profit imperative there, there might be a bit of pushback, but come on, when people arrive in, in the green, clean south, I think it's an embarrassment if we're selling um, crappy water in, in, in cheap plastic um, that not only is optically bad, but bad for people 
people's health. And I think it's well worth noting. I think Mr. Cooper alluded to the fact he was honest about it. Um, but um, in, throughout the world, in terms of recyclable, in inverted commas, coffee cups, 99.75% of those end up in landfill. So th the word is there, but the reality is, is, is not, not the truth of the matter. So I think we can, we can do better. And I think, as I say, that's, that's low fruit, easy stuff. And um, I welcome Mr. Hocking into, into the group and just, uh, just flagging that you know, a, a starting point is to deal with some of those nice, easy, easy, easy things to tick off early and get some, get some runs on the board. That's it. Another look. So I'll just make a couple of comments. Uh, when it comes to the commercial companies, I think the Eden International Airport should be included in that. And uh, I'd like to see that. I mean, it did, did return a dividend and it is profitable. And I think that could be certainly included in the four. And um, we'll add it to the four, add it to three to make four. Uh, and, uh, you know, I live in hope that it will return even greater profits in the future. And the thing is, with the other companies that are in there, the railways, stadium and venues, uh, they are community good, but it doesn't matter where you put them, it's still um, how they perform is how they perform. And I think there's an advantage to having uh, the commercial governance eye cast over them uh, in order to you know, run them as efficiently as possible. But they could certainly be uh, subcategorised within the portfolio so that we can see exactly what they were costing versus how much the others are producing. So you could make that separation. But how they perform is likely how they'll perform. However, uh, I think there is an advantage to having that, as I say, commercial governance overview. However, um, at least at the end of the day, the, uh, we are in the black here and receiving a, di a dividend from these companies. So that's something, and Lord knows, uh, if you look at the New Zealand share market and a lot of other big companies throughout the country, we've been through a very challenging three years. And um, I think for many companies around the world and around New Zealand, it will be a very challenging year coming up as they face the hangover and, and increased interest rates and increased costs uh, that everyone, including our residents and ratepayers, are now incurring. So I commend uh, the board and the management uh, of DCHL uh, for achieving a positive result. I think well done uh, under trying circumstances and I think overall uh, it, it could certainly be a lot worse and I think they have done well in the circumstances. So having said that, I'll uh, put the motion that we note the annual reports. I think we can go all those in favour say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thank you. Uh, and that ends the public part of our meeting. So we'll now move to non-public and uh, take a little break. We'll take a recess for five minutes. Uh, seconded. Councillor Walker, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Carried.